Listen, Tony Gooch, welcome to Chew the Chat podcast. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure to have you. Appreciate your time. It means a lot. Um, for viewers, listeners, you are um, you're somebody who I came across through Sean Atwood's podcast, True Crime podcast, yep. which is smashing numbers. I think you have 300-odd thousand numbers on there. Yeah, it's done really well. Um, your personality came through. Um, some similar some similar walks of life that I've moved in in my time. I felt an affinity with you. Yeah. Um, but it was it was interesting to learn your story and how you, at the time when you were in jail, you're now a reformed criminal. You've got a movement now where you've got an agenda to help kids and yep. help young people make better decisions. Um, think First initiative, is that right? Yep. Um, think First is basically thinking about what you're doing before you do it. So it's yeah. considering the consequences before the actions. Mm. That's the idea behind it. And you, at the time, you, you when you were in jail, something bizarre happened that kind of gave you a uh, an angle in your life, which you're now pursuing. And yeah, you, you was, ended up on the television while you were, while you were in jail. It was a, an unexpected platform that I could jump on. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted how well it done. Mm. Um, but the three episodes, it seems like episode one was the favourite, yep. um, which was the one I starred in. And I've got a lot of, of work and graft off the back of it. So so that it, was that was inside prison, ITV. Britain Behind Bars on ITV. That, Britain, yeah. Britain Behind Bars. Yeah. And it was filmed inside the prison. And inside. it was, And you were kind of, from what I sort of took from it anyway, you were kind of the like a, a go-between between kind of staff and the inmates and just making, like, managing shit. You were making yeah. people so <laughs> communicate like and mediate. It's yeah. like a job in there. You, you become an insider. Right. And it's basically so that prisoners can come to you if they don't want to go to the screws. Got so if, if they think they're going to get beat up or it's a beef outside that's coming to prison and they don't want to be called a grass, then they can come to an insider and say, look, this is going on, what do I do? Mm. And then we can try and intervene and sort it out and try and keep everyone safe. I mean... The way I look here, everyone's in prison, everyone's doing a sentence. So no one deserves to die in prison as a result of an argument. You're doing your time, you're doing your punishment, you want them people to get out because they've got the opportunity to turn their lives around as well. Mm. And if they die in prison over saying stupid, they're not going to get that opportunity mm. to become a, a good a role model in society. So mm. Mm. It, it was a good job, I enjoyed it. Um, a lot of funny problems with the job as well because you get really silly arguments. I can imagine, um, yeah. But it is quite funny. You get people coming up to you and going, I've just bought a load of spice. I've done it and I can't pay for it. What do I do? And I'm like, <laughs> you're fucked. Yeah, like, you've I got about know. four minutes before yeah. you can't even walk. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, <laughs> you owe the money. They're not going to take me going up to and going, listen, I'm an insider. You mm. can't pay. Mm. What, can we leave it? They, they're not going to have that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But a lot of the time they just get shipped from wing to wing, but eventually they run out of wings to go to and then they get shipped out of jail. And what about actually being an insider? Do you get stick for being an insider? Or not, is it something really. that people are after or what? No, nah, I mean, when anyone that's been to prison knows, when you go in, you're on basically 23-hour bang-up apart from your association and exercise. So if you can get any job to get out of the cell more, you're going to take it. It's, mm. it it's, you're stupid if you don't. Who wants to be locked up in a cell all day? Mm. So by being an insider, I was opened up in the morning and I was practically out all day. Mm. So it suited me down to the ground and you're getting paid for it. So That's awesome. It's, it's a no-brainer. What's the kind of... The uh, the brief in terms of the prison staff, what are they looking for in an insider? I imagine it's a specific kind of person to a degree. I mean, you know, they've got you. you what came across to me was your your ability to be kind of dem. There's a there's a demo. Uh, what would you say? Um, an ability to be. Um, you could delegate. You could delegate ideas that maybe weren't weren't people's favourite thing to think or whatever. And you could you, you there was a form of. Um, your personality coming through that was just, I don't know, making things smoother, it felt like. It's, it's not a case of making it smoother. It's, I mean, my personality, anyone that knows me, knows what I'm like. So I'm, I'm not the, the quiet one in the room. I'm always the loud one in the room. I'm always the one that people notice. So I'm no different in prison. Mm. It's not that I'm intentionally doing it. It's just my character. So where I've got that ability to talk to everyone from all different walks of life and, and reason with them and talk to them on the level, 
that's the sign, kind of person you want to be an insider. You, you've got to be able to talk to everyone. You can't have the attitude of, oh, I'm, he's Asian, I'm not talking to him, or he's black, I'm not, or he's a traveller. Do you know what I mean? You can't mm. have that attitude. Mm. And with me, I tend to get on with everyone, so it suited me down to the ground. Yeah, that came across, that came across. So how, in terms of um, when, the, when the, the TV company come in, was that like a, did you hear about it prior? Was it like a, a whisper? There was whispers, yeah. yeah. There was whispers, and everyone was like, nah. Yeah, I ain't going near it. Did you know straight away? Did you think fuck it, or did you have to think about it? No, I was like, I'm, I'm not going on camera. I didn't want anything to do with it. Mm. And then uh, Mr. Walker, the SO on the wing, he come to me and said, "Look, can you please just have a, a talk with the camera crew?" And my main worry was was that I would say something, and then it would be edited, yeah. and I would be made out to be something that I wasn't, um, and that that was what I was uncomfortable with. But Jamie Button, who was the cameraman for that, what a, a decent geezer. Like, I heard you say that on Sean's, yeah. He's, um, like, shout out to Jamie if you're watching. Yeah, he's, uh, and his wife Kitty. He's um, he's one of them fellas, you, I'll know him the rest of my life. Yeah. And um, it, he really has helped me. He's helped me understand the industry, how it works, how I can move myself forward um, and, and go in the right direction. And, mm. and that's, that's the way I want to go, so... And where were you on in terms of your sentence at that point? Did it did it, did you sort of come out of that situation and think, "Fucking hell, there's something there's something here." I, was... it, I mean, no one could have foreseen how successful it was going to be. I yeah. mean, we knew it was going to be on ITV, so we knew a lot of people were going to view it. Mm. But I honestly thought that the clips that I filmed would be so minimal it would kind of get lost in the programme. It'd mm. be like such a small snippet. And then the way it come out, I was in like loads of it. Yeah. So I, I was being seen a lot. I mean, if I could go back, I probably would still make that same decision because I've had nothing but positive things come from it. Yeah. Um, and the direction I'm going in now, all it's done is benefit me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you've got a lot of fingers in lots of pies at lots the moment. Lots and lots going on. Lots yeah, going well, on. we'll get to that. It's exciting. So... We won't go too far back um, because I'm interested in the future. And as we did with Darren G when we had Darren on, you know, um, you guys have done big podcasts with with Sean and you've told a lot of that story. But I am interested to know a little bit about childhood and a little bit about your trajectory, how you ended up in crime and knowing what I know now from Darren and my own, my own trajectory as well and lads that I grew up with. Some lads end up in situations that they're not meant to be in, you know, and they somehow they pull themselves around. And I love that. I love bounce back. I love a story when someone, you know, can can make themselves, set themselves straight. I think that's amazing, you know, and then give that that experience to other people. So what was childhood like for you? And <clears throat> it's like, um, oh, it's an enigma because there was no rhyme or reason for me to end up doing the things I did or mixing with the people that I did. Um, as far as I know, there was no one really in my family that was doing the sort of things that I was doing, even in the past or, or present. So it, I can't actually explain that. I mean, you get kids today where you've got ADHD. Now, I was very, very hyperactive as a child. And that hyperactivity sort of come across in in my school days would be like uh, I'd make people laugh I'd be like the joker of the class but as I got older it sort of developed into something different and it become not being the joker but the person that wanted to do everything now then and there so if there was something to go and do it'd be me through the door it, yeah. it'd be me grabbing hold of someone it'd be me whacking someone it, it was always me and it wasn't that I wanted to do it it was just because it felt natural for me to do it yeah and my way of thinking was is that no matter what we was doing i'd always have the mindset of i don't want you to do that because if you fuck it up you're gonna fuck the whole thing so i'll do it because i know i'll get it right right got you and that that's it just it led on to other things and it sort of progressed and then before you know it you, you're heavily involved in crime mm. and there's no looking back after that and it becomes so natural mm. like, do you know what i mean it's like mm. a bricklayer going to work that mm. i'll wake up and that was my job it, it was just natural i didn't feel like i was doing anything wrong mm. so how old was you when you realized that you were kind of there's a it's one thing having a tur you know a bit of a tussle with the lads in the playground or something yeah. down the street and then as you know as you move into a world where you start doing things that you maybe give a second thought and think hmm how old are you at that point i think i was around about 23 22 maybe all right everything up to that point was for fun yeah so like 
from a policeman's perspective, it's like he's committing so many offences in the area. We've got to do something about him. But my perspective was it was just like I'm having fun. Right. We're not doing it for financial gain. We're doing it because we're bored and we're having a laugh. Yeah. So we go out and nick cars, we go out and nick bikes, and you'd end up having a couple of fights when you was out clubbing. It was nothing serious. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the penny drops that you can be earning money in what you're doing. Right. And as soon as that happens, the progression is very, very rapid mm. because you go from small-time offences to big-time offences because that's where the money is. Yeah. The intention is completely different. Like you say, you're a kid different. just kicking your heels and stuff in the crack with the lads in the, in the area. Yeah, to then, it, like, hang on a minute, there's there's money to be made, and then where there's money, there's all sorts. All sorts, and it, it's, the, it's the, the, the degree of planning. So when it was fun, you could be walking down the road, and you'd be like, oh, there's a Ford Orion, we'll have that. It was a spare-of-the-moment thing, or a motorbike, it's a spare-of-the-moment thing. Mm. But then all of a sudden, you're, you're sitting down with a group of people, and you're planning to do something. Right. And that's where it takes a different turn, mm. because then you're, you're, you're pre-planning, and then you're carrying out, and then there's the bit afterwards to make sure that you covered your tracks and you're doing things properly, and mm. it, it becomes a lifestyle. It, you, you commit an offences in the day, and then you live in the high life during the night times, yeah. and the money just comes and goes. Yeah. You don't even look at it really as money. I used to call it fun tokens, yeah. because I didn't look at it as money. If I had two grand, I'd be like, it's not two grand, that's a table in a club, yeah. that's a couple of strippers, and that's a load of booze. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's the way you looked at it. You didn't look at it as money. It was just what you needed to live the life you wanted. Yeah, got you, got you. So what about with your folks then? What was the situation at home? Are your mum and dad together? Are they kind of, are you in a kind of nuclear family? Is, is, there, is it balanced? My real dad left when I was very young. Right. Uh, and my stepdad, Nick, he's been there for me from two years onwards. And... I can't, I can't, I can't big him up enough because the amount of shit I've put my family through, and to know that they're to this day still sticking by me, yeah. is a big ask. Mm. Do you know what I mean? If if I could go back, I'd love to get his perspective. If you knew what I was going to do, would you have stuck around? Because it, it it was the volume. It was it wasn't like I was doing one thing one day and then there'd be a three month gap. It was constant. Like when I was a kid, I think from. 13, 14, every single Wednesday, without fail, I was in Staines Magistrates Court, without fail, right. every single Wednesday for something different, and it just went on and on and on, and it, for them, I mean, I'm a parent now, and if my son was doing the things I was doing, you're at your wit's end, it's like, what do you do? Because mm. I'll get grounded, but I'll jump out the bedroom window, and I'll, I'll go out anyway, mm. then I'll get put on curfews, and I'd still jump out the window and go and do what I wanted to do. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Imagine yeah. my mum and dad shock when they're getting a call at three o'clock in the morning saying, yeah. we've got your son in custody. And they're like, no, you haven't. He's, he's in bed. Yeah. And they're like, no, he's here. And they go in there and be like, fuck, what's he done? Do you know what I mean? But that's how it was. And what was your mum like with you then? Was she kind of uptight or was she kind of just like, what are you doing to me, Tony? Come yeah, on. Was, but this is why I think it's the um, the hyperactivity. It, I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. It mm. was like, I'm living in the here and now. They're all going out, why should I miss out? And that's the view I had. Why, why should I be grounded? Why should I not be out? And the group of people I was mixing with, it was just constant. It was motorbikes and cars. That that yeah. was it in my early teens. I didn't I didn't go drinking. I was, didn't really go into a pub or a club until I was 18, 19. Right. Because we just weren't interested in that. Yeah. We just didn't. I, the thought of me standing at a bar, uh, at a bar and drinking with my friends... And talking to each other, I'm like, what's the fucking point in that? It's fucking boring, mate. I'd rather be doing 140 mile an hour at dual carriageway with someone chasing me. Do you know what I mean? So do you put it down to literally just the environment that you're in then? I firmly believe, and I say this to kids when I talk to them now, if you're in a group of people and they're all doing heroin and you don't, eventually yeah, you're yeah. going to end up doing it yeah. because it, it becomes natural, it becomes normal. Mm. And it's hard to explain this to, to normal law-abiding citizens because they always say, well, why has he done that? Mm. We don't want to help him because he had a choice and he's still done it. And it's very hard to get that across. Yeah. But all of my friends were all nicking cars and bikes. Yeah. So how would how was I not meant to end up doing it? And they kids you're going to school with and you live in your area, they live on, down the street. Yeah, just, is it? I grew up in uh, Staines first, then I moved to Shepparton, which is next to Sunbury, um, and all of my friends were from around like the Sunbury area. Right. And there was about 20 of us, I'd say, um, and every weekend we'd all be together and mm. you'd end up doing pills, you'd end up doing gear, mm. and then mm. all of a sudden someone would go, let's go and nick a car. And you'd mm. be like, fucking great idea, yeah. let's go, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it was Jesus so when you without shooting forward too far obviously your, your Think First campaign that you, you now 
you know you know fronting and you've also got your own kids as you as you said what are the steps that you take what are the the thoughts that you have about trying to create a world or an environment for your boy where maybe he's not in that situation how do, how do you get around that i believe in this day and age now as a parent you have to pay very close attention to who your child is associating with yeah and if you're busy at work or you've got a career and you're not paying that attention it's that easy to let that child slip because mm. if you're not focused on who they're hanging around with and you don't know what that group's doing, mm. you haven't got a clue what your child's doing. Mm. And your child is always going to say, oh, we're over the park playing football, mum. We're just having a laugh. Do you know what I mean? But really, they're out doing things. Of course. So for me, with my son, it's I'm always constantly saying to him, oh, who, who you hang around with at school? Like, what's their names? And like, if I go to the school, I'll see the parents. I'll see what the parents are like because... To me, if a child goes off the rails to the extent that I did, and it's hard for me to say because I don't believe my mum and dad were at fault. Yeah. But that's only because I was so persistent in my behaviour. Mm. But if they had have spotted early on the people I was dealing with and what they was doing, maybe I could have been pulled away from it. Right. But I was that persistent, I don't know whether I'd have listened. And it's a difficult thing to do that as well, though, because how do you decide, right, well, you're not fucking kicking around with Danny anymore because I don't like it. How do you have that conversation? Because I've got little ones and one day it's going to happen, you know, where it's like, fucking hell, like you say, I don't like what's going on there. That's bad vibes. How do you... For me, it's being strict. It's having something in your child's life that they can focus on. Yeah. If if you've got a child that's not doing boxing, that's not doing MMA, that's not doing something outside of school, they're always going to get bored. And yeah. that boredom leads to going out and hanging around. Now, for me... If I was ever to drive up the road and I saw my kid hanging outside Londies with a group of boys, I'd be like, nah, mm. because that's where it starts. Of course, yeah. So I'd be like, nah. I'd rather you be in somewhere knackering yourself out. And a few of my friends, um, I'll give a shout out to Joey St. John uh, and my friend Ginger. Uh, Ginger's son is young, but he focused on getting him into boxing. And he's now won titles. He's doing really well. And he, now he's got that mindset of training. If I went to him and said, do you want to go down the pub? He'd be like, fuck off. Like, mm. I've got a fight in two weeks. Like, and because mm. he's got that mindset, he's focused, he's away from the arseholes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what you need to do. Yeah, it's like a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. Exactly. They, not... they need a mission. When you're that young, you need something to, to put all your energy into. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that's really difficult in, in culture now, isn't it? Because, like, what, what have kids got? They've got phones. You know, we don't want to build them more skate parks. We don't want, you know, we, we're kind of removing. I read a statistic, I think, something like, for every 12,000 kids, there's like um, 30 uh, youth clubs or something like yeah. that in, in more depraved areas. And I thought, fuck, man, there's, you know, when you do start thinking about more depraved areas, you know, below the pover impoverished areas. Yeah. You've got to give them something to do because the education is not necessarily there, you know, and that Londis picture you just painted. Yeah. That's on every corner, isn't it? But and then they push the each problem. other. If you've got a, a mum, there's a single mum that's living on the Denton estate in Camden, yeah. in Chalk Farm, mm -hmm. they haven't got the funds to send their kids out to do something. It's not that they don't want to, but they're struggling. They have yeah. to, they have to uh, upkeep the household, do you know what I mean? So you've got a kid in the house running around like a lunatic, he's under your feet or she's under your feet, you don't know what to do, so in the end you're like, go out and play. Mm. And that's where it starts. Yeah. Because you've, you've lapsed that little bit of attention because you're getting a bit stressed out and you don't yeah. want your kid around you when they can be outside playing and you can get the housework done, that's when they're starting the associations with these people. Mm. And if you don't jump on it quick, before you know it, they're, they're gone. Do you mm. know what I mean? The attitude mm. starts, then it's, fuck you, mum, I'm going out, I don't give a fuck, fuck the police. And it's too late then. Do you mm. know what I mean? Because then that group of friends they're associating with, to them, is their family. Yeah. In their eyes, all of them people in that group will die for them. Yeah, that's more it's, more connecting, more meaningful than exactly. anything else. And then it's like you, you're part of something. You feel like you've got a purpose. And whatever they do, they're going to follow. Mm. And then lo and behold, years later, your so-called group of family, every time when you get nicked for the first time and you come out and they're like, oh my God, bruv, he got nicked, he didn't say nothing. This, this guy's a proper safe, like we're going to keep hold of him. And then five years down the line, you'll get nicked together and they're all like, yeah. he's done it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And and then the penny starts to drop. They don't really give a fuck about you. Do you know what I mean? The only ones that are there for you constantly is your family. Yeah. Well, that leads me on to where I wanted to go next, which was, so you're getting into your early 20s and you say things start getting, you know, more serious, let's say. The money gets involved. So what's the first thing that happens that you do something that you end up thinking about maybe on the way home or whatever, or maybe you don't, where you think, fucking hell, that was a bit heavy. 
What, what is, what's an example of that? It, it started with the cars. Yeah. So we had the ability to get a high volume of cars very quickly because this is back in the days before like all the big alarms and trackers. You could just walk up to a car and take it. And all of a sudden, we had groups of older people saying, look, we need a fast car. We've got something going on. And you'd be like, oh, well, we'll, we'll give it to you for this much. And mm. then before you know it, you're accumulating a lot of money. But then all of a sudden, the penny drops. Hold on. We're nicking these cars for them. And then they're coming back and having it off with like 30, 40 grand. We sold them a car for 300 quid. So fuck this. We want to be doing what they're doing. Yeah. So you sort of climb the ladder that way. And then before you know it, you're doing what they're doing. Right. So the... the what, it, What's the moment then when you find yourself in that position when, you know, you are doing what they're doing? Well, the, the minute you, you're in the car ballied up and you're ready to go and do something. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the, I can remember the, the first few times that we went on to do things when I was very young. And your nerves, your heart's racing, the adrenaline's pumping and you think, oh, I don't know, because half of your brain is saying you shouldn't be doing this. Yes. But because of the people around you, we've got to get in there, we've got to do it quick. You don't, you don't want to lose face, so you're going to go through with it. And the buzz from it is very addictive. It's more addictive than any drug. Because, because of that anxiety, because of that fear. Yeah. And then when it comes off and you get a reward at the end, you're like, I fucking like that. That's, mm. that's good. That's a good thing. That is. Mm. So you sort of keep going back to doing it. But after a while, you become numb to it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I used to get that buzz when I was young, I never got that when I was older. Do you know what I mean? You go and boot someone's door off and grab someone and wrap them up and you'd be like... Mm. One of the stories I remember you saying on Sean's podcast, and people should check Sean's episode out. What number was it? What number was it? I mean, if they search for your podcast with Sean, uh, it's Tony Gooch. Uh, just type in Sean Atwood, Tony Gooch. I'll, I'll link it in in the bottom anyway. But it's a great podcast. But um, I, there's a bit that stuck stuck out to me because I remember it from lads that I grew up with, where you'd said, "Look, anybody who bursts in a place shouting and fucking screaming and blah blah blah, like they they, they ain't at the place where they need to be yet because nah. you don't go shouting and screaming." They ain't got a you don't want all the drama of it. No, nah, if, if I was in my living room yeah. and the door come off and I had a load of geezers going, oh, yeah, I'd be like, oh, sweet. You get up and just start banging them. It's when you're sitting and all of a sudden someone comes through the door and you don't even know they're there. They're the proper bods. Mm. All the screaming and the shouting and the smashing out, it's, it's all bollocks. You want The idea is you want to get in, do what you got to do and get out without getting caught. Mm. So you going through the door and immediately going, Rah! Noise and co drawing commotion. drawing attention to yeah, it. So yeah. then people, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing it because they feel they need to do it or there's a necessity to do it, but they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're mm. not the ones to be worried about. Mm. Mm. So when when things obviously get serious, there's obviously a first time when you have a situation with the police and jail for the first time. How old are you at that point? And what does that do? That half of the brain that you talk about, that's like, shit, I shouldn't be doing this. Does that conscience come in? Do you think, fuck, I'm going to jail? Or are you like, yeah. fuck it, I'm going to jail, this is going to be kudos for me? Well, the thing is, you sort of convince yourself. Where you sort of go to court and you get away with it, you get community service, you get probation, you sort of think, I'm not, I ain't going to go to prison, this will just carry on. And I remember I went into uh, Staines Magistrates and I was up for like fucking six counts of driving whilst disqualified or something stupid. And the magistrate said, look, we're, we're deciding whether to send you to prison or not. And I was like, fuck, this ain't good. And then all of a sudden, they said, we got a break for lunch. So we come out, and I remember we drove to McDonald's, and it was when the Flat Eric tune come out. Oh, right. Flat yeah, Eric. Yeah, yeah. And I was talking to my mates, and it's like, you won't get banged up, don't worry about it. Because everyone's saying it, you're like, ain't going to happen. And then I walk back in there, and there's like, right, we're giving you 12 months, you've got to do six in the Young Offenders. And when you're that age... How old are you at that point? I was about 17, 18. Right. Yeah. And um, you sort of sit there, and you think, fucking six months? It's, it's, it's like getting lived off. Yeah, like, of course. Six yeah, months. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's fucking ages. And I remember going into the cell and I was looking at the calendar and I was like, this is a fucking long stretch, this is. Mm. But then later on in life, you're begging for six months, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but at the time, you're like, oh, So man. how did you how did you feel, you know, on, you, on your way into jail as a 17, 18-year-old lad, are you thinking, right, given what you've said so far about you, the way you, you, you are kind of high energy and that, are you thinking, right, I've got to adopt my fucking position here early? Do you know that already? It's, are you head up? Are you head down? No, nah, you, you can't go in there with your head down and looking all vulnerable because then you're just bringing it on yourself. My, my aim was to just go in the same as when, when I'm outside, just get on with everyone. Do you know what I mean? Got, if, yeah. if you get on with everyone, you're not really going to get problems. Yeah. And as soon as you start associating with certain groups that are in prison that have been there longer than you, they already know everyone. So anyone that comes to them is like, who's this cunt? They're like, no, it's all right. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And you have a smooth ride. Mm. I mean, you always get certain instances where 
you're going to have to fight. You, you know it's going to happen. And it can be over the stupidest of things. I remember in, um, in Wandsworth, um, I'd just come in, I walked up to the counter, and because no one knew me, the kid behind the counter sort of gave me like half a chicken wing sort of thing. It's meant to be like a leg. And he put it on my plate and sort of had a little smirk. And I look round and everyone's looking at you. So it's like you're in that position of, do I walk off with it on the plate and or, look a cunt? Or, do something. or I've got to do something. So I fucking threw the plate of chicken at him, jumped over the counter and started weighing him in. And I got fucking bent up and took down the block. Right. And that in itself is an experience because when you first go into prison and you haven't been to segregation, you sort of think if you do something wrong, you just go back to your cell. Then all of a sudden you've got fucking 10 screws dragging you into this fucking cell with nothing in it, and they're like, you're in here for two weeks, and you're like, fuck. Fucking hell, two weeks? Yeah, you know, for a fight, you can, it's CC, you can get like four days, six days, but the more, the, the bigger the severity for the offence, the longer you're going to get. And what's that like then, the first time that happens? I mean, yeah, are you literally in a room? You're in a room with nothing in it, and Wandsworth is like a fucking dungeon. What, not even a bed? Nothing? No, you get like, um, you've got a bed, but it's very low down. It's right. probably about fucking... It's just like Ten a inches curb off the floor, like yeah. A curb stone. And back then, they used to open your door in the morning and take the fucking mattress out. So then, all you had was like an iron squared frame sort of thing for the bed. So you can't even lie down. So what that's goes through your head on day one in there? Fucking got to get out of here. Hmm. That's that's what you're thinking. I've got to get it's out. Because if people stop and think about this for a minute, yeah, like people, probably a lot of people listening to this podcast because of the conversations we have. You know, people have tried to meditate. They've tried to you know, in this mad world we're living in, trying to have five minutes. And people, if you try and sit on your own and be still and just fucking think on your own, don't, people don't like it. It's difficult to do. That's Never, what's the hard bit to deal with, yeah. though, is you've got nothing to do, but you're in own, that your environment. own thoughts, that's it. I mean, when I was in um, High Point, um, I basically got caught having a, a relationship with a female officer. And I got dragged down the block. And in my head, I thought, oh, I'll be like two weeks and they ship me out. I've done 16 fucking weeks in, down segregation. And believe me, I don't give a fuck who you are. When you're down there for that long, it starts to take its toll on you. Because you've got nothing there. Fucking hell. Is, there, was, is there anyone in other cells around you? In other... There are. You can talk out the windows, but a lot of the time, they're only down there for having a punch up or something. So, so they're, they're there for like five days a week and then they're gone. And when I was down there, there was long periods where there was no one else down there. And I was on a four-man unlock, so literally they'd open the door, I'd have a phone call, and I'd be banged up again. What do what, you do? do you how do mean? you... I mean, you strike me as... A, you're, you're an anomaly to me from how I feel about you because that what you've said already in this podcast about your attitude to getting on with everybody, that came across massively in Sean's um, episode. It came across in the in the ITV show to me. We've been together today. I get that from you. I get like, and I know we'll get to it as well. You, you've MMA fighter. You, you know, you went for titles and and everything. You're a, you're a dude in who's um, who's got energy and anger in him. But I don't see the anger. I don't feel the anger. No, nah, it's the thing with my temper is that when I look at other people and they start to get the ump, I look at them and think he's angry. But with me. There's no in between. Right. I'm either normal and placid, or I've lost a plot. Right. And it took me a lot of years to bring that under control, and especially even related to the the, the crime sort of uh, period. If I went on a job and something went wrong and I lost my head, you're then doing things that you're not thinking about, yeah, and, and that's when you make way. mistakes. Mm. And it's you just don't think. All of a sudden, you're running up the road of a knife or a machete, and you're chasing someone into a van, or you're dragging someone into a car because I've got the ump, and I don't think about what I'm doing. And it's taken me a long time to bring that under control. I mean, now I've got certain points. There, there's certain things that can set me off. I mean, anything to do with my kids or, or my yeah. family, it sets me off. But I, I've learned to bring it under control because I know that if I get to that level where I've lost my temper, that's when I do something stupid and mm. I end up getting banged up. Mm. So to go back into segregation for a minute, because I'm fascinated by that, because like I said, 24 hours in a day in a, in a cell, never mind in segregation, is a fucking long time to, to just be with your thoughts in a place where you know there's no, there is no like fun ticket, as you called it earlier. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're not, there's no fun tokens. It's like you and your thoughts. What's the process in those 16 weeks? Talk me through like the mental kind of undulations you must have gone through. Are you like strong? Are you then? Are you losing it? What's your body doing? Are you losing weight? Are you training? Are you it, well, because you're in the cell on your own, part of that regiment is you wake up, you do a cell workout, 
and then you'd, I'd read a bit of a book, and then I'd know him, yeah, it's around about lunchtime. So then I'd have lunch, I'd do another cell workout, read a bit more of the book, listen to the radio. They used to give like these tiny little radios in there sometimes. So I put that on. I remember it was, um, you know, Rihanna, that yeah. umbrella song. Yeah. Everyone in the, the block all had these radios. The amount of fucking times I heard that song. <laughs> I swear to God, all you could do was umbrella, Ella, Ella, and it drives <laughs> that you drive nuts. You fucking mad. But the thing is, you don't know how long you're going to be there for. So even though I was there for 16 weeks, I never knew I was going to be there for that long. So I only found out then, um, for the first time, that when you're in segregation, they've got these things called arrhythmias. Now, these arrhythmias, you have to have a nurse sign one, um, the governor signs one, and a priest signs one. The minute one of them doesn't sign one, you're classed as unfit to be in segregation unless there's uh, high circumstances like Charles Bronson, like you can't go onto a normal wing. As soon as they don't sign one, they have to either ship you out or put you back on the wing. So every time I went into the governor's office, which is like every Friday that you've been down there, i will be like, what, are you shipping me out? And he'd be like, nah. And I'd be like, why? And he'd be like, I don't want to. And I'd be like, oh, fuck. And it was because it was one of their own that I'd done it to. Do you know right, what I mean? I've got you. Yeah. So got, yeah. she actually got grabbed. I went on a, a visit on a, um, in the visiting room and she was on duty in the visiting room. So I'm sort of sitting there and we're having a little smile to each other and all of a sudden there's like five screws come in and they've spoke to her and they've escorted her off and I thought this ain't fucking good. So I went back to the cell after the visit and I had um, I had a mobile phone. You know, you get the little mini hi-fis with the two speakers. Yeah. So I had my phone in a sock and I used to undo the back of the speaker and leave it inside. And I was lying on the bed and I was waiting for it. And I was sort of lying there and nothing's happened. And I thought, nah, nothing's going to happen. It must have been about something else. And just as I relaxed, the door went and there was like an army of screws. And they're like, you can't block. And I was like, fuck it, sweet. So I got up and went to the block. They found the phone. And then I had, um, where I was um, at that time, I was emptying to drum and bass. So I'd have like a lyric book where I was writing lyrics. And, oh, wow. I and, didn't know that about you. Yeah, yeah we'll I'm still doing it now. It's all kicking off again. But in that lyric book, I'd written part of her address on one page like the road name then the door number on another page and in my head I'm thinking they never going to fucking find that and then I went in front of the governor and there's like why have you got her address in your lyric book and I was like oh oh, I haven't and he was like yeah you have and I was like fuck and it was as soon as that happened I was just like I'm going to be down here for ages because her husband was a gym PO right so I'm banging her and then he's spotting me on squats down the gym so it didn't go down too well when, so when it all happened where's the banging happening so basically, when I was on, I think it's house block four or five in High Point, it's, there's, there's two like new wings that are set back from the rest of the jail. And when you're on servery, the doors would open for the servery workers before the rest of the wing come out. It's, it looks so you can get the, the food prepared and all the rest yeah, of yeah. it. So she basically got moved from the induction wing where I met her and she asked for a transfer over to the block that I was on. Right. And then she would open me up first. And there was only one officer at that point that would walk around on my block to open everyone up. So she'd quickly open the door and come in. We'd have a quick run. And then, really? we'd, it, and then we'd come out, open everyone else up and go and open the servery sort of thing. That must be fucking gold dust Lit when up, you're in I jail. Listen, it's like fucking all your Christmases have come at once. But isn't that like, a, I bet that's a 50-50 split though as well because I bet there's people that are pissed with that and as well. We well, well, that's how I got caught. Um, she left her uh, knickers in, in the cell and there was a geezer called Pete. He, he'd been in there for fucking, I think he'd done about eight, nine years. And I walked in the cell and I said, I've got a present for you. And he's like, what you got? So I got these knickers out and rubbed them under his nose and he went, oh, <laughs> like, he couldn't believe it. And then someone else come into his cell and he showed him the knickers oh, and he no. must have said, oh, Gooch got them. And then it sort of all come yeah. about and they started investigating it. And I guess with this, I mean, again, coming back to your personality of getting on with everybody, does that go as far as with the screws and with the governor and that? Are you kind of amenable with them to yeah, a degree? Yeah, I mean, you get, these, um, you get these inmates that sort of go out into prison and they're like, fuck them, they're the enemy. Fuck the system, but it don't get you nowhere, does it's, it? It's, what mindset is that? You, you can't, if you haven't got the intelligence to work out that you can't fight the system, yeah. it's like a casino, the, the house always wins. Yeah. So your, your ride will be easier just by getting, you haven't got to like them, you haven't got to go out for a beer with them. You've got to be smart. But there's it? nothing wrong with being polite to them and getting in their good books, do you know what I mean? Because mm. that in itself brings up opportunities. Mm. Especially like in Highdale, where I got on with everyone, they come to me and said, oh, we've got a job for you down healthcare if you want it. Of course. And my security level, I wasn't allowed a job off of the wing. And them officers fought to get me down there because they was like, look, let's give him a chance. And the governor was going, fuck that, he's not coming off the wing. And in the end, they give in. And I went down and I found I'd done up like four months down there. 
And that was like one of the best jobs in the jail then because you're out your cell all day. You don't even go back for lunch. You, mm. you have it down there. Mm. So there is pluses to getting on with the officers. Of course, of course. Because on, on, on a much lesser scale, when I was a young lad, you know, getting arrested even, Saturday night, Friday night, whatever, you get banged up. I would always think, as soon as I got cuffed, it was like, okay, that's the end of the game tonight. If you go, you know, and it would do my fucking head in when you get someone coming next door shouting, screaming all night, banging the door, be like, look, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Right? Get your head down, be nice to someone, they might let you fuck off in the morning. Yeah. And I always, I always wondered about that. So, when you're, when, I guess, when you've had that scenario with, with the staff <laughs> and you've been having your fun, the male staff, I bet, must be pissed with that because they just must think, you fucking cheeky cunt. Well, you've got to remember, they're all friends. They will mm. go down the pub after work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when this come out that this was happening, a lot of them were pissed. But there was, um, in, in High Point, there was two officers. They're called the um, the Stevenson brothers. And anyone that's been to High Point on their house blocks, they will know who he is, like a short little stubbly geezer. But he could, he could have a row. I think it was a boxer back in the day. And uh, he come down to the block to see me, and he was like, what have you done? And I was like, well, fucking, it is what it is, isn't it? Do you know mm. what I mean? I said, I ain't forced it. Do you know what I mean? It was, it mm. was a mutual thing. And he said, they ain't happy about it. And this is the same officer. Um, I was on the wing one day and there was this little yardy geezer that was a cleaner and he kept fucking giving it to everyone. He was just a bully. And he never done nothing to me. And one day I was out mopping the ones and he's come out and he started bullying this kid through the door saying, you've got to give me this on your canteen, you've got to give me that. And I thought, fuck this. I went up there and smacked him straight in the head and I'm chasing him round the wing with the mop handle. <laughs> and Mr. Stevenson's come on with the other screws and he's like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> And uh, we went to the block, and I think they, they hated him. And this this comes back to what I'm saying about getting on with the screws. Yeah, he yeah. took the avenue of, fuck you, I don't like none of you. So their attitude was for him. As soon as we can fuck you over, we're going to. Yeah. And we sort of both got nicked, and we got put back in our cells. And when we went down for the nicking, he got CC, and Mr. Stevenson coming with me, and he went, is it is a good one, this one? And he went, all right, no problem, you didn't do that wrong, back to the wing. There you are. So it serves its purpose. Oh, absolutely, you know what I mean? absolutely, absolutely. So, fucking hell, it's a whirlwind. So... 16 weeks in segregation towards, I guess, every time that door gets, someone comes to that door, are you thinking, fucking hell, here we go? Well, I was on four-man unlock, so the only time my door would be open would be for them to slide my food in. Right. But when I got to the 12, 13-week stage, my brain's ticking now, so I'm thinking, I've, I've got to do something here, because I'm just going to... I think I had about a year left, nine months left. So I was like, what can I do? So I went the route of, when the door opened, I come out and I smashed up the, the, like the dinner thing there's like a little trolley that the trays going so i ripped all them out smashed more got bent up in the strip cell then i started trying to attack the screws that weren't working i kept going in front of the governor and he went no you ain't going nowhere and I, do you know what to this day i don't know the kid's name but they put a geezer in the cell next to me and he shouted me up to the window and he went if you want to get out just try just try and kill yourself he said as soon as you try and kill yourself they've got to ship you out and i was like yeah so I worked out, it was around about four o'clock or whatever they used to come around with dinner. And I, I made this strip out of my me, um, me sheet and I've tied it around the bars at the window. But I made it like three foot too long. Right. Because I thought, <laughs> no, in my luck, I'll do it the right length and jump I off and fucking laugh. hang myself. I shouldn't laugh, Tony. So um, <laughs> I've heard them come into the door and as the door's opened, I'm holding on to the bars and I'm like... And they've all come running in, they've grabbed me, they've cut the thing, they threw me in the strip cell. And then when I went in front of the governor that week, he went, you, you've you got to go because the nurse wouldn't sign the arrhythmia. Right. So they said he's got so to go. So it worked? It, it worked and I got shipped to uh, Wayland. Right, so if you're out there, whoever that dude was in the next cell. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, fucking <laughs> fair play. And then I got to Wayland um, and when you get to Wayland, it's, it's a bit weird because they've got like these four man dorms. And you have to go into a four-man dorm with three other prisoners, and then after a certain amount of time, you get a single cell. So because I'm now so used to the block, you saying to me, well, if you don't go in this dorm, you're going down the block, it's like, so? But I'm, I'm used to it anyway. So when we got there, the governor was waiting for me as I got off the bus, and uh, he was like, you, you're going in this dorm? I said, well, I ain't. He said, no, you've got to go into a four-man dorm. I said, if you put me in the dorm, I'm just going to set about the other three geezers in there. I said, I'm not going in a fucking four-man dorm. I said, I, I, I'm on my file, I had to be in a single cell constantly. And he literally said, look, what can I do to keep you quiet just to finish your poxy sentence? And I said, look, I love the gym. And I, I, I was gym addicted at that stage. And he said, look, I'll get you a job in the gym, I'll put you in a single cell. I said, fucking sweet. So he'd done it, and I, I don't think I got nicked for one thing there. That's that, yeah. So that's interesting then. So when you said before, when you're locked up in the segregation and you're doing your 
your cell workout. How long is your cell workout? Is it the same every time? Are you mixing it up? Yeah, I don't know how long it was, but I used to do four sets of everything. So you yeah. do like flat press ups, raised press ups, yeah. decline press ups. You'd sort of um, try and uh, use the you, you juice bottles to yeah. make a bit of weight to do some arm curls, yeah. sit ups. It'd probably be about forty five minutes, I'd right. imagine. Right. And you were you regimental with that? Was that something you looked forward to, or was it something you just knew you just had no, to do? You, you had to do it because with me, where I was hyperactive, I had to burn the energy because mm. if I didn't, I'd end up doing something stupid. Yeah. So for me, it was a case of wake up, do the thing, it'd knacker me out. And then I'd read the book, and then by reading, your eyes get tired, I'd probably nod off for half hour. Do you know what I mean? It just killed the day. Perfect, perfect. So reading. Um, what books are you reading in there? Are you after specific books, specific knowledge? Are you just picking stuff up? Because I've just picked a book up off the Sean. If Sean Atwood's getting a lot of love tonight, Sean. Um, one of his guests talked about 48 Laws of Power, yep. which turns out it's one of the, the most uh, read books in jails. Yeah. And it's a fucking big book, isn't it? Have you read that? Did I you get involved with one. that? I haven't read that one. So what sort of stuff would you be reading? I started off um, with me with a book. I have to find it interesting. Yeah. If it's one of them ones you're reading it and reading it and nothing's happening, yeah. I'll, I'll get bored of it. Of course. Uh, Martina Cole. Oh, yeah. a lifesaver for me. Yeah. She's, her books are brilliant. And she's written a lot. She, her books are brilliant. Um, and then I went on to, to read um, autobiographies by people like The Craze, The Lambrinos, mm. Dave Courtney, mm. uh, Roy Pretty Boy Shaw, Lenny McLean. And then once I'd gone through them, I sort of wanted to um, to try and challenge myself by reading something that I wouldn't normally read. Got you. So I started reading like Winston Churchill's autobiographies, uh, Machiavelli, The Art of War. Yeah. Um, and then I found them really interesting and I learned a lot from them. Yeah. Um, and how to 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 use your words to influence other people to get what you want in in a mm. sense mm. without being pushy or aggressive you don't have to do that there's yeah. always another way around it mm. so i found them books quite interesting and winston churchill's book was absolutely brilliant i loved right. it absolutely so loved that's it. kind of a bit of a therapy as well then for you in your mindset and the the, the the very reason you're in jail is that madness and the you know, communicating through your energy yeah. without language necessarily. Like you said, you're not ranting and raving, you're going in stealth. Yeah. So you must be thinking, are you are you like correlating when you're reading those kind of books, when you start getting into Churchill and Machiavellian and all that, are you starting to see patterns of behaviour and start to work things out a bit and think, hang on a minute, I can see how these things play out a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Why why are these why we end up doing the things we do sometimes? It's, it's, not, it, it was, it's more the fact that situations I've been in in the past, you learn how you could have handled those situations better and still got the end result that you wanted. Yes. Um, and that became very apparent later on in life. Mm -hmm. It's like your brain as a criminal is always, if you don't get what you want, it's always, fuck it, smack him, go and smash that cup, threaten someone. But you, you come to learn that there's other ways you can go around it and have the same effect and still reach a goal. Mm. So that became a big thing in my life as I was getting older. I learned mm. that in some instances, you're better off doing things the right way because you still reach a goal and you don't get the shit bit. Do you know what I mean? So I started to take a long look at my actions and what I was doing before I'd done them sort of thing. Mm. So when you got your job in the gym... And you got your single cell, and you said you got your single cells like specified for you. Is that yeah. something that you 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 fought for? Yeah, well, no. It, when you go into a double cell, if you keep having multiple fights with your cellmates, you end up being on single ma uh, single man bang up. So on my file that followed me around to every prison, it's saying that he's got to have a single cell, and. A lot of the time, especially later on, like in the last sentence I'd done, you get to a point, you're like, oh, fucking wish I was in with one of my mates because you can play cards and stuff. And it's very hard to get that lifted off. Um, but where I got on with the officers again, and this is another reason, yeah. you're like, oh, God, listen, my mate's over there. Well, really? <laughs> and he's like, no, you've got this thing on there. He's like, oh, come on, mate. And he's like, they take it off. And I got it took off. And um, I got banged up with my Cody, and then I got banged up with another geezer called Jamie. Um, he'd done about seven, eight years, uh, and that, that's when we finished our sentence off in Bullingdon. Right. But he was, uh, Jamie was a character. What, okay. What a character. Oh, well, Jamie, again, if you're watching Jamie. Ja Jamie, yeah. I won't say surname because he might not like it, but Jamie. But I remember a funny, funny story with Jamie. He had um, he had done these seven years, and he was up for parole. And obviously, you can get random piss tests. And a couple of weeks before, or a week before, a couple of the boys have come through with a bit of gear, and they're like, oh, we're going to get on it, coming themselves. And he's like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. So he's ended up getting off the nut. And then Sod's Law, they've come and they said piss test. And he's like, fuck. Oh. And he's like, what do I do? And he's like, I said, the only thing you can do is get somebody else's piss that, that ain't done nothing. And he was like, oh, all right. So we've got a rubber glove that you use on the surgery. Mm. 
and we got someone to piss in it. And obviously he's put it down his trousers and he's gone into this cubicle and obviously the screws stand there. It's like a urinal on the wall, yeah. but they're watching. There's like a little wall. And he's in there and all of a sudden you could hear him go, you could see his head going because we're all on the, on the thing outside, like in the communal bit, where we're cleaners and that, we're allowed out there. And we can see him getting all dripping. And, like, and then all of a sudden he went, ah. And we're looking, we can't say nothing. And he's come out and he's good to gaze at the pot like that. And he's walked out and I was like, what's up? He went, I couldn't fucking get me now through the glove he said so I bit the glove and it went <laughs> all over his face we was pissing ourselves absolutely wetting ourselves I said but did you pass he went yeah I oh said, that'll do oh, that'll mate. do but he's out now he's um, he's uh, he's found Christianity oh now and he's um, he's doing really well so a big shout out to Jamie and, he's, um, and with your experience then Tony in, in jail when you've talked about it at the beginning of this podcast about you know the idea of re- the idea of jail is rehabilitation unfortunately it feels like in the end the system doesn't gear towards that so much what was your experience with other guys were, were you seeing people making changes and learning shit and, and thinking actually or were, or were you seeing people kind of evolving into deeper levels of criminality in it depends on the sort of person you are. If mm. you're, um, if you committed an offence where it was like someone done something to your sister and you weren't a criminal, and they've gone round and they've weighed the geezer in, they're not in that life. Yeah. So when they come into prison, you can sort of see that they're not about that life. They're they're like a a lone individual that's just got a sentence. They want to do it and get out. Now that sort of person will come out and go on to lead a productive life. Yeah. But if you take a person that's come from a group. It's like an occupational hazard. Mm. And now they're in prison and now they're meeting other criminals and now they're learning about other w- ways of criminality yeah. that they can earn a profit from. Mm. And you can see the itchiness in them where it's like, I've got to get out, I can't wait to try this. Yes. And like when I when I was banged up then, um, it was sort of just starting with the, the cash points, everyone blowing up the cash points. And it was slowly filtering down from like Manchester, Liverpool. And it was like, if you do this... You can blow a cash point up. Do you know what I mean? And you can see people, I can't fucking wait to get out. And it's like them people, there's there's no help in them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because the forward thinking is all ready to commit more crime. And in their head, they don't think of, if I get nicked, I'm looking at seven. And the problem with it was, is that all these people, when it first started happening, they wasn't thinking of what the government were going to do to counter it. So in their head, they're blowing the cash point up and they're getting the dough and they're doing like 15, 16, 17 cash points and all of a sudden they get nicked and they're like, we're nicking you on terrorism charges. And you're like, hey, it's a cash point. And they're like, yeah, it's an explosive in a public place. And then you're looking at Big Bird. But by then it's too late. And then you're looking at fucking doing seven, eight years. Do you know what I mean? and, And the thing is, when I go back to about the fun tokens where you get the money and you don't look at it as money, it's the same with that sort of line of work. Yeah. They're, they're getting large amounts of money, but as soon as they get it, they've already said in their head, oh, I'm going to buy that, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy that. So they go and buy it and then they've got the money left. It's like, don't do another yeah. one. Yeah. And then they get it all and they accumulate all this stuff and then they get nicked and they're like, proceeds of crime, taking it all off you. So it's just like... Just, and then you come out and you're back to square one again. It's just, yeah, perpetuating. And it, to get someone out of that mindset is difficult. And this is why I'm working so hard with the younger generations now because it's so easy for young kids to see groups of criminals that are doing well and they think, I want some of that, but they don't see the end bit. Do you know Mm. what I mean? And by the time they're getting nicked, they're doing it. Do you know what I mean? They don't get the chance to see the shit bit that comes after. Yeah. And it's just getting them to think. Do you know Mm. what I mean? Well, I like that because you've you've kind of said that as well a couple of times just in, in telling stories anecdotally, like... If you, you said earlier, if, if I could look back and just fucking tell myself to think about what I'm about to do, you know, and you, your campaign now is think first, isn't it? Which is literally that when that red mist comes and, or we've got that point to prove or we don't want to lose face or the lads are moving in this direction, you kind of, it's fucking really, really hard, isn't it? To just... But it's hard to understand. Like you've got this thing in London at the minute with the postcode wars. Right. Like, what the fuck is going on? Mm. It's like you're in a group. Remember what I go back to about. Just pull your mic in a bit. Yeah, um, I'll go back to if you're in a group of people that are doing something, mm. you end up doing it. Mm. So imagine now you've got kids. These ain't adults, these are kids. And they're in a group of people and they're hanging around outside the shops. That geezer ain't from our postcode. Let's go and do him. What the fuck for? Mm. Like, what? what's the goal? What? What? What's the end goal in it? You go and do him, 
there's fucking another 5,000 people from that photo club. What are we going to do? Stab all of them? And what about the idea now that a lot of them, it's all Snapchat and it's all the social media and they're, they're filming each other and they're drilling each other with the rhymes and everybody's goading everybody and it's all about prestige and how many likes and he's got fucking 16,000 followers because he did this and that to fucking... Yeah. So that, that pressure of you and four lads in a car... The, the, and them other four lads making you think, fuck, right, no, come on, this side of the brain, we're doing it, come on, yeah. fucking bally on, is now 8,000 followers. Do you know what I mean? To I, impress. My view is that, I mean, I love music, I've always loved music. Yeah, I, I want like to get all, to that. I like all different kinds of music. For me, I believe that the government took their foot off the pedal, they weren't paying attention, and I think YouTube especially was very irresponsible by letting drill music become not music but as a way to get to other groups mm. and don't get me wrong if, if if you're a young kid and you like rapping you like emceeing sweet pursue it do it but don't do it in such a way that you've got a rap about oh my mate stabbed him mm. that kid's got a family now mm. imagine what they all want to do to you because you put it all over social media yeah. and i think they're irresponsible for letting that happen because there are drill artists out there that are good musicians, they are good rappers. Mm. And I think it's the the other ones that, that sort of ruin it for them. Use it as a vehicle, like you say. To, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not being funny. Growing up, if, if I went out somewhere and there was someone else at a party and there was like, look, he's about it, he's done this, I wouldn't never stand there and go, fuck me, he's done this, he's done that. He, he's like someone special, do you know what I mean? And for me, the, the drill music, it's like, I've stabbed someone, I've done this, I robbed his grow, I've done it. So fucking what? Mm. Sweet, you've done it. Keep mm. your mouth shut and move on with your life. You ain't got to tell everyone but about the it. But the irony, Tony, is exactly that. It's like underneath this, and this, this for me at least, my the way I unravel this is I think this applies to everything. This applies to selfies from the average Joe. It's not just in criminality. It's like we've... We're all seemingly at the minute desperate to prove ourselves in this insecure kind of way. Like you say, I've done this, I've done that, or, you know, I'm with these people and we're... That's happening everywhere we look. Everywhere. Everywhere we look. We're just fucking gagging. We're whoring for attention. And obviously, if you are living in a world where you're on the edge and things are shady and things are shifty and things are exciting, as you said, you know, when you do pull that bolly down and you're fucking shitting it, then you go, no, nope, I'm doing it. Then the woo... The lift yeah. is massive, so them kids who are drilling each other and what have you, they're seeing them likes coming in and the fucking comments and the followers, and it's feeding this thing that underneath is just... It's nothing. It's insecurity. It's nothing. It's weakness. But this is the problem. When social media came about, no one knew what it was. No one knew what it would grow to, and no mm. one knew what the consequences of social media would be. And it's now, it's, it's very hard for me to understand because there was a group from Birmingham um, quite recently, I think it was about six months ago, they went and robbed the safe. Now they've done the bit of graft, they've got away with it. They're, they're, they're home free, there's no forensics, there's no nothing. But then you go to Selfridges in London and you're filming yourself buying thousands of thousands of pounds worth of gear and you ain't even got a fucking job. And it's like, what are you thinking? It's like, I understand the fact you want to go on social media and say, oh, look what I just bought, i just done this. But police can see it. And I have this argument with everyone. And like now, I obviously post a lot on my social media pages, but that's only because I've got nothing to hide. There's yeah. no reason for me to cover anything up. Yeah. And then I look, you see criminals' Facebook pages, and I think, would you walk up to a policeman, because you're an active <laughs> criminal, would you find one in the street and go, pull over a minute, mate. <laughs> I went to this nightclub on Saturday. This is who I was with. This is what I spent my money on. And this is where I'm going next week. You wouldn't do it. No. But they do it on social media. Mm. It's like, th there's no thought process there. No. It's like, I've done it. I want to put it on social media. And how many music artists are we seeing now that were massive talents, that, that had real potential, and they're getting banged up for murders. Mm. And they, and they're in prison and you see them on their phones and they're trying to put music videos out from their cell and you're like, they're clinging on to that social media status. Yeah. But it's going over the top of their head that you're sat in a cell for the next 15 years. Mm. But still then, all you're bothered about is getting a video up. Yeah, and getting your likes. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand how we've come from when we was kids. If you had a problem... You had a straightener. At the end of it, you shook hands, you got on with your life. I don't know where we've gone from that to he's got to go. He's got, you've got to stab him, he's got to go, you've got to shoot him, he's got to go. I don't get what the end goal is. I don't get 
the 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 prosecutors in this country they have a ninety five percent conviction rate for murders. The odds are stacked against her. Yeah. So why would you risk going behind bars over killing someone over what? Mm. Like even if you killed him and you got away with it, what have you achieved? Yeah. Like, I, I can understand it from the mindset of he's robbed someone in our group. Now we have to do something called everyone's going to rob us. I understand that. But still, why have you got to kill him? Mm. Just go and give him hiding. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't understand how we've got to that point now where human life is just, it's just not valued. Yeah, I think that's a really key, key point and a key part of where we're at in culture because... I think when you when you talk there about, you know, once upon a time we had a straightener and we shook hands and we moved on, like, once upon a time, you only knew the people in your fucking town. Yeah. You only heard a story get passed down about some of the bigger lads, this thing happened last week and you just get a version of it. You didn't fucking watch video of it. You didn't, you, you, you weren't, like, connected to millions of people with all this expectation. Oh, in Manchester, this is happening. In Liverpool, that's yeah. happening. In L.A., they're doing this, the fucking New York, you know, like we've just got all this, I don't know what even to call it, data, just like information, just ideas, um, influence happening everywhere. And all of a sudden the speed of our behavior and the, and the, like you say, the, the, the value of life in this walk of life, you know, young kids who are, like I say, not thinking before they're acting and they're maybe feeling lost. Maybe they're from broken homes. Maybe they're not, they're in gangs, they're just looking for something and they ends up going down a crazy road. And kids, you mentioned a story on the way here about kids fucking mowing each other down with automatic... Do you know what I mean? There was one in Hayes a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the one I was, I was going on about with my friend, like two ounces of weed. That's what it was over. And the geezer got stabbed like fucking, I can't remember, it was like 18, 20 times. You're talking about fucking 300 quid here. Is that really worth someone's life? Is that how you want to get your point across? And I'd love to to, to go to a prison and talk to someone that's been convicted of, of a murder because I'd always say to them, if, if they've got kids, do you love your kids? Do you love your mum? Do you love your dad? And the, the answer that you would get, you, you know, is going to be, yes, I love my family. But then the next question has to be, if you love your family, why the fuck would you put yourself in a position where you're now going to watch probably your mum die while you're in prison your kids grow up without a dad, your dad possibly dying, your grandparents dying while in prison. If you love your family, why have you done this to them? Mm. And, and to what end? Mm. E even if you're getting paid, and don't get me wrong, I remember when I was a kid, you used to hear about people wanting to kill people and all the rest of it, and it'd be like, oh, if someone wants to pay 30 grand, 40 grand, you're talking about a grand, two grand. Like, you, you're not even getting financial gain out of it. Mm. So I, I, I don't get what the incentive is because it's not it's not financial. Mm. It can't really be reputation because if you kill someone, you can't fucking tell no one you've done it. Yeah, like if you've got, yeah. a, do you know what I mean? You can't yeah. run back and go, "Oh, fucking knocking someone out!" Like, yeah. big up, like you can't do that. You can't tell mm. no one about it because you, you end up getting nicked. So I don't get what they're aiming for. I I'd, don't get what the goal is. I'd be interested to know how many lads there is in jail right now that had that moment where they just fucking lost it you know, whatever it was, like you've been on, jobs that maybe gone a bit skew with and something's happened and someone's fucking hit someone with something they shouldn't have done or whatever, or maybe they've gone too far, like you say, you've, you've lost your mind and for fucking a split second or a mad 30 seconds, too many strikes or whatever it is, and then boom, then you're back in the room. Yeah. But now you're fucked because that's it now. Even if you, you're good, a good prisoner and you, you know, you manage to get out in good time, you know, you've got to live with that. Do you know what I mean? You've got to live with it. How many lads are sat in there now with 15, 20, 25 years in front of them? I've got a mate who's 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 doing exactly that. For a mad decision, 30 seconds of madness and now 25 years of like thinking about that 30 seconds. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there's certain instances where Every human being, whether you've come from a rich background or a poor background, everyone's got them buttons that can be pushed mm. to get them to that limit. Now, for me, it's my kids, my family. For other people to reach that point where they feel, I've got to kill someone, I, d I don't get how you get to that leap. Do you know what I mean? Even if I was in a situation where I thought he's got to go, at some point, whether you've lost it or not, your brain's going to be saying to you, consequences. 
Because if you don't, you, you're fucking dumb. Like, everyone knows the difference between right and wrong. Now, a lot of these kids are going into a house or they're going to see their mates over the park or they're meeting up, and it's like, did you hear about blah, blah? He robbed blah, blah. If we see him, we've got to do him. Now... In that situation, as an individual, I'm walking up the road, I see the geezer. Why the fuck ain't these kids thinking, well, hold on. Why have I got to do it? Mm. What am I getting out of it? Mm. What, what, what are you getting at the end of it? What do you think you're, you're going to relish in the, in the, the acceptance once you're, you've been given your 15, 16 years in prison of your little circle of friends outside going, he's a G. Yeah. He's proper. Yeah. Fucking brilliant. I'm doing 16 years. And let me tell you, all these people, do you remember going back to uh, how I thought my friends were my family? Yeah. How many of them family Around. are sending you money? Yeah, yeah. How many of them family are coming up every week to visit you? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And it, mm. at, at first, it might happen. But see, when you're three, four, five years deep, now all your mates are having kids and they've got a family and they've got a career, yep. they ain't coming to fucking visit you. Yeah. So what have you done it for? But trying to get that message into kids' heads to think about what they're doing. That's why what you're doing is so, so important, Tony. That's why it's so important. And the same with Darren when we had Darren on, you know, and I commend it for, like I said at the beginning, like, I love anybody who's prepared to be fucking straight up with themselves and say, fuck, hang on a minute. This isn't on. I'm making crazy mistakes. I need to square myself up. I'll take it on the chin. I've done what I've done and I'm going to move forward and actually use that to help people. When, when you've been in situations then, because... We'll get to it. You, 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 lad who's Andy, you know, you, you, you're an MMA mate, you're MMA trained, you know, you know how to do what you need to do. You're not just a fucking game lad, you know. Was there moments when you might have done something? Did you ever have to pull yourself back? Did you ever hit the red line and think, fuck, you know, I've got to, you know, I'm, I'm about to do something and go too far? Did anyone have to stop you doing something that yeah, maybe there, went too far? There's been a few occasions where it's happened, but it's slightly different. It's, it, if I'm in a fight, I want to hurt you. But even if I'm in a fight, if I knock you out, I'm not going to stand there and start jumping over your head. You, you're no longer a threat to me. I've proved my point. I've done what i come to do. Now, if you put someone in an argument and before they left their house, one of their mates a couple of weeks before got stabbed or someone they know got stabbed, there's people looking for their mates. Mm. So they think, I'm going to have to take a knife with me to defend myself. That's how, that's how the logic yeah. will work in the yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah. So now they've got the knife on them. Now, all of a sudden, this skinny little person that can't fucking fight, he's in a gang or he's doing whatever. He might have thrown a couple of bricks through a window. He might have even juked someone, but you can't fucking fight to save your life. Now you walk around the corner and you've got half a lump in front of you and you're thinking, I'm going to get battered here. Because you've got it on you, the first thing your brain will say, mm. I'm going to stab him. And then they're dead. Mm. And that's the problem. That mm. That's where we're at now. Mm. It's not the point of the, a lot of these kids are taking knives out with the intention of stabbing someone. It's that when the situation arises, it's there, so they use it. Yeah, yeah. And then it's too late. Mm. And I, 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 don't know, I don't know what the government can do. I mean, I thought about putting serial numbers or something on knives just so you could trace them back to mm. their origin. But mm. even that wouldn't work because they'd end up nicking them or getting them second hand of people. There's a way around everything, isn't there? There is, but at the minute, I mean, you've got all this COVID crap going on. Are they bothered? Of course they fucking are. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. them, it's like, it's just, a, it's a formality. You, no matter where we are, how intelligent we get as a human race, you're always going to have criminality. That, mm -hmm. That's fact. Mm -hmm. There's been criminality since we first come about. So it, it's never going to go away. And the way that they're handling it, I think, is just, it's wrong. They've got the attitude of, Right, this young kid has stabbed someone. We're going to bang him up for 16 years. What do you think that kid's going to be like when he gets out? What do you think he's fucking reformed? Mm. Do you think he's going to come out and go and get a job at Canary Wharf? It ain't going to happen. Mm. Now, if you give a 30-year-old 16 years for stabbing someone, you should have known better. Yeah. You're 30 years old. You've yeah. had a life and you know what you're doing. Does that kid? Because in my book, mm. you, he's done a bad thing and you, you've took someone's life or you've attempted to take someone's life. They're a fucking child. Their mm. brain's still growing. They're still learning life skills. Mm. Now, for me, if you take that kid out of the environment that he was in and you teach him and you show him the right way, can they become a decent human being? Mm. And don't you're never going to get all of them, but I believe a large proportion you could. Mm. And I don't think the government are doing enough to pull these people away. So when you were in jail, Tony, did, w was there any kind of... Um procedures or any kind of um any of that happening was there any teams that were 
picking up and coming in and and helping people in any way? There are, but they're so out of touch. I mean, I remember I was in Idaho, and this is quite funny. And um, one of the screws come to me and he said, you're going to get tag or you've been put forward to tag, right? But I had had escape from lawful custody on my record. And once you get that, normally you can't get tag. But because I was working... You've escaped? You escaped? Escaped from lawful custody, yeah. I was under Wandsworth rules, but I was in hospital and I'd done a bunk from the hospital. We'll come back to that. And um, I told the story on Sean Atwood. I think I've got a memory something, yeah. And uh, basically they come to me when I was down healthcare and they said, look, if you do this course, we might be able to swing tag for you. And I was like, what is it? And there's like, it was this um, this anger management or enhanced thinking skills or something like that. And I remember I walked into this room and I had the mindset then of just do it to get the tag. But because of my way of thinking, when something annoys me, I can't put up with it. I can't tolerate it. So uh, I'm sitting there and this woman comes in. She looks like a fucking hippie. You, you take one look at her and you think you're so out of touch with what's going on. There's no point in talking to her. And then all of a sudden she says, everyone stand up. So we all stood up, there's about 10 of us, and she went, I want everyone to put their arms out like this. And I was like, all right. She went, pretend to hug a tree. <laughs> that was it. I fucking launched the chair at her, and I, I, I got dragged out of the fucking room. I was like, what the fuck are you putting me through? Like, <laughs> I've got to where I am in my life, and your answer to it, to correct it, is to fucking pretend to hug a fucking tree. That isn't there, But yeah. it just goes to show how out of touch the government is with reforming. Mm. For me... It's all about association. If you've got a kid on a council estate and he's committing offences, often that the police know of with other individuals, you need to take that individual away from the problem. If you leave them in it, you're never going to solve it. Yeah, it's just not going to happen. Self perpetuate it all the time. And I, I, I don't believe in taking kids away from parents because I, I think that has a detrimental effect on the child. But I believe that they should like put something in legislation where if your son is nicked or convicted of more than two offences and you're on a council property. You have to move. Mm. And they move you somewhere right out the area mm. where he can start again. And it, it's got to be far enough away that they can't jump on the train and go back. And not into a, that area, but just somewhere no, else. you have to take them away from the individuals that are still committing the offences. Otherwise, mm. they're never going to change. Mm. And you're putting these kids in young offenders. And what are they doing in there? They're going in there. They're going to the gym. They're going on exercise. They're associating with other criminals. Their release date comes back. And it's like, I'm out. What, mm. what, what have you taught them? Mm. What, what have you shown them? How, how have you reformed them? You haven't done anything. You've literally put a time delay on his offending. Yeah. So you've been away for a year. He ain't committed an offence for a year. But I guarantee you within six months of him being out, he is committing offences. Well, he's been on a course of how to commit better offences. That's he what has. he's been doing, it's, hasn't he? He's it's, been it's, learning It's, it's the, the college trade. of crime, isn't it? That's what prison is. Mm. Mm. And it, something's got to change. I don't believe the answer is locking kids up. And I, I stress the fact kids. Adults are a different story. Yeah. But kids, there has to be an answer. There has to be another way we can go to reform these kids and give them a second chance. Is there been, a, I mean, I don't know how much you know now about young offenders and the system itself, but has there been any movement? Has anybody been implementing any change based on what we're, we're talking about here and trying, to, they trying have, to evolve? There are new schemes, but they don't follow through on them. So the government's attitude is you go into prison, you have to do this course, this course and this course, and then you can get tag or you're eligible for parole. Now, the problem is, is when they come out, now, I've said this on, on the Sean Atwood programme. You're on probation, you're on licence. Now, when I used to go on probation, I would walk through the door and my mindset was, I'm going to tell you everything you want to hear so that I can go. There was no part of my brain that, she's right, she's talking sense here, I weren't interested. You're just ticking the boxes. And as soon as you left, you're back to doing what you're doing. Right. And it's like, and then you get nicked again. And I never had anyone come to prison, like a probation officer or anything, and go, why have you done it? It's like you're in you're in the the, the system again. I'm doing mm. that sentence and I've got a different probation officer. And it's like they don't follow through enough. There needs to be more schemes outside of prison. I mean, even tag. You're on tag. Sweet. What time's my tag? Seven in the morning till seven at night. Sweet. So I'll just go out drumming all day and then I'll stay in on, at night. Do you know mm. what I mean? You, you, you're not solving the problem. You're just limiting them to the amount of offences they can commit. And then they're straight back into the social circles they were in before. So you're not solving the problem. Yeah. And I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it's that million dollar question. What do you do? Mm. But my view is the, the main thing is taking them away from the people they're associating with. And like I said, if you've got decent parents, 
maybe they can implement things at home to get you out of that circle. To, but you get these kids now. I mean, you get 15, 14 year olds now and it's like, fuck the world. Yeah. They ain't listening to their mum and dad. They're mm. more interested in being out with their mates because that's what's important to them. It's not, oh, if I go and do this course at college, I could get that job and I can be earning that money. It's, um, mate, he's just had an on top on the phone, like someone's coming for him. We've got to get round there. And then before you know it, you're banged up again. And it, I think that especially the colleges and universities, they have this attitude of, well, you ain't got them qualifications. You can't get in. You can't do it. And you can go and do a college course. I mean, anyone can go and do a college course, but where's them opportunities being pushed into them? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I think they, they should make it compulsory as part of their licence. We'll release you early on tag, but you have to be in college five days a week and you can have the weekend to yourself. Mm. Fair enough, they might go back to the social circles that they're in and as long as nothing happens where they're going to get nicked, Monday morning they're back in college. Mm. And then I'm, I would hope that eventually, when they when they see the potential in themselves, because a lot of these kids... That's a key point. They think, yeah. A lot of these kids, they think, oh, I can't do that. I'm, I can't, I'm fit. And I'm, nobody's I'm there to support school. them and nurture exactly. and no put belief in them. them. Yeah. I got told by, by police officers, by judges, you will amount to nothing. You're going one way. That's nice. So what the fuck are you doing about it then? You're mm. telling me the obvious, mm. but what are you doing to help me? You ain't doing nothing. Mm. And I, I just don't get it. They're, they're quick to round out the sentences and they're, they're quick to label you as a criminal. But what are you doing to help that individual? And it, there's not enough there. There's just mm. nothing there. Well, I think one of the most powerful things is is exactly what you are doing. Um, people like you, people like Darren and all the guys, Sean even, you know, Sean had his, his situation, didn't he? Where, yeah. you know, in Arizona he got locked up and had that, that whole American experience, you know, and... Going around and talking to kids, there's a, there's a difference. I mean, I had a DJ on, we'll get on to music soon because I'm interested to know about the music. I had a Nomine on. Nomine is a producer. He used to be called Outrage. Um, and he he came on earlier this year and he talked about um, being, he was working as kind of support, kind of um, insourced in universities and colleges on yeah. the music stuff and teaching kids how to produce and and he said that when he was doing it as kind of outsourced or insourced, coming in and helping the kids, he'd have a better rapport with the kids, and they would they would feel like he was one of them almost. And then he would get a really good kind of belief system, and he could inspire them. And there's just a just a connection, something moving. Yeah. Then later on, he actually took a position in the university as you know part of the faculty or the staff or whatever you want to call it. And then he said. It just changed. It does. Same dude, because now you're part of the the system. The system, and then the same kids. He'd no say, you know, who, who, who's struggling with, you know, whatever. If you're struggling financially, or if you're struggling with, you know, you know anything mental, anything, everyone heads down. And all of a sudden, the people that he could get to, and there seems to be something in that structure. There seems to be something. It's like when your mum tells you to do something, you know. But if you hear it from somebody else's mum and she delivers it in such a way, you might consider it. It's a strange human thing, isn't it, that we're we're up against? I don't think it's it's the process. So if you look at artists like Dizzy Rascal, Dizzy Rascal grew up in in a rough area. He grew up around people that were bang at it. Probably to this day, he's got a lot of friends that are in prison or they're dead. And he himself got stabbed in uh, IB for I and Napa, I believe it was. Now, I don't think there's enough to, to promote the process of getting from being a no one to getting to where he is. Now, it's all right him doing word of mouth to certain individuals that he knows, but to the masses, it's like, I can't do that. Yeah. He, he had a touch getting there. Like yeah. he, must do, he must have had a bit of luck. And there needs to be more, and you have to understand that a lot of these kids are into music. That's the culture we're in now. It's rapping, it's emceeing. Now, why can't we focus on that skill and give them an avenue into provide, the music yeah, industry. Provide, yeah, provide, facilitate it. And the problem with that is, is that a lot of the, the 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 music industry are like, can't work with him. He's active. He's done this. Can't can't work with him. And that's what needs to change. Mm. And it's the same with employment. I mean, they've just had a change in the law now. Um, you know, when you you apply for a job and it says, have you got any criminal convictions? Every offence you have, depending on what the offence is, you, it becomes spent. So I believe, like for a burglary, it's like four or five years. So after the four or five years, you can legally put. That's no. a light points on your license, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Now the problem with that is, they've got to go to four years. 
before they can write that. So yeah. a lot of the, the attitudes is, well, fuck it, I can't, I can't write no, they're going to find me out, so what's the point? Mm. And I believe the government should be putting certain employment um, companies in, in a placement where they have to give that person a chance. They have to give you a job mm. and they have to supervise them. Even if it's like when you're in, you're in school and you're naughty, they put you on report. So well, what's to stop the government saying, right, these massive five companies here that have got thousands and thousands of employees, we will dedicate a certain team in each office to bring in five individuals from each area and give them a chance, show them the ropes. That in itself brings them away from the social yeah. circles that, yeah. that they're involved in. But they're not doing that. Their attitude is... Why am I going to give you a job when I've got another kid that's never done nothing wrong in his life? Yeah. Why, why am I going to take that risk? And I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But by having that attitude, you're feeding the yeah. criminality yeah, yeah. In, in, in the youth. Mm. And it, it, it's just not an answer. And I think that these massive companies that are worth millions of pounds, it's, it's like, look, look at Facebook. How big is Facebook? Mark mm. Zuckerberg has got more money that he knows. He probably wipes his ass with 50 pound notes. Do you know what I mean? Mm. What's to stop him from saying, right, Young offenders in Britain, when they're released, anyone that's shown interest in IT, I want to give them a chance. But I'm going to give them a chance in a Facebook office in Oxford. And they live in London. You're taking them away from the environment. Yeah. All right, sweet. We've got an accommodation place set up. We can live there. But if you fuck up, you're out. Oh, that, that, that's feasible to me. Yeah, well, yeah. Why can't they do that? And you're getting a sense of purpose as well. You know, the idea that someone's giving you a chance is something that means something. Like you say, taking you away from somewhere, all of a sudden there's there's something to play for. There's something to that means something. Exactly. And I mean, you look at the um, the minimum wage and things in, in this country and it, 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 it's so obvious, it, it's almost annoying. It's like yeah. you've well, got the is, government yeah. saying, well, they're all committing offences, there's no reason for it. Why is a youth at 17, 18 years old going to go and work for £300 a week when they can go and sell a few packs in one day and earn the same money. Mm. There's no incentive there. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So th they need to compromise on the money they're getting to show them that, hold on, I can do this and I can sort... You're not going to earn the same money, but as long as it's enough money for them to live on, mm. to sort of lead the lifestyle they want to leave. Mm. That, that, that's an incentive for them to come away from what they're doing, but they, that's not there at the moment. Mm. And it's like, well... Go and commit offences, do what you want to do. If you get caught, we're going to bang you up. If we give you a job, we're going to pay you £300 a week. Even apprenticeships. I've spoke to kids that have got apprenticeships. The money they're on is fucking abysmal. Yeah. And it's like, these these were established companies. Like, there's one kid that I know that was um, learning to do tiling. They used to retail swimming pools. Now, these were a big company. These were a million-pound company. But yet you want this kid to work 12 hours a day, five days a week, for 300 quid a week. Mm. Like, that's a lot of time isn't it's, it it's, it's just it's unacceptable it's unacceptable and then you talk about music there and you mentioned Dizzy Rascal and I really enjoyed Dizzy Rascal recently on James English podcast and big shout out to Dizzy Rascal because as you say you know he's lived a life where he managed to pull something together and yeah a lot of people will think oh you know I can't do that because I'm not that talented or maybe I didn't get that look or whatever but he's still a beacon and powerful Dizzy Rascal you know um, but again people like you people like Darren people who are um, maybe a bit more tangible, a bit more in touch, you know, it would seem to a lot of young kids. That yeah. message is powerful. Um, music. So you was, you mentioned earlier you was emceeing. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. So when does that come around? Have you always been into music and how, how did that come about? So from a very early age, I loved drum and bass. That it, I loved it. All, all, and again, the, the circle I was in, everyone listened to drum and bass. So mm -hmm. the more I heard it, the more I liked it. You start to hear people like Shabbity, Skibbity, x Man, and you're thinking, oh, well, I quite like this. So mm -hmm. I started writing um, and I had a bit of luck. Uh, a girl I was going out with in Felton, her best friend Tiggy, was going out with a, a man named Paul Ibifa. Now, Paul Ibifa was Shabba's manager, um, and they had Highly Blessed, which was uh, around at the time. And he heard a demo tape, and he said, right, I want you. So I started performing at Bagley's, at Stratford Rex. Bagley's, I had a lost all, night in Bagley's. King's Bagley's. Cross. I love yeah. Bagley's. A lot of nights in there. <laughs> and um, it sort of propelled me, and it gave me the incentive to think, hold on, I've gone from writing lyrics in my bedroom and emceeing on me mate's decks in his bedroom... And now I'm on a stage in Stratford Rex with all these artists. And the penny sort of drops. I, I could do this. Like, if, if he's got the belief that I'm good enough to be up here, 
I must have something. So that was what we just fucking spoken exactly, about. Exactly. By by giving them the encouragement and the, the belief, you you sort of excel in in, in that in that um in it lights that the fire, doesn't it? Yeah. I can do it. And then I met um, MC Flight. Um, absolutely, he's one of my best friends. I'll know him till the day I die. Um, um, what a talented fella! Like right. he will write a lyric in the space of a few minutes, and you're like, "Fuck me, that's good!" Like mm. it's on par with anything that's going on in the scene. Relevant, current, yeah. on it. And the, the the problem with it is, it's it's the same as drum and bass on its own is hard enough to break into now. I mean, if you're dedicated and you, you keep yourself out of trouble and you keep going and you're promoting the scene, you you will eventually get somewhere. But when you look at the the larger music scene, your Rihanna's, your Jay Z's, if I said to you now, you're you're a talented musician, I think you could get to that level. You'd look at me like I'm nuts. Yeah. But my way of thinking is, well, they got there. How did they get there? And mm. and that's what's missing. Mm. And uh, the, there's a lot of blackballing that goes on in the scene. You can have an artist that's really really good, but because he's done A, B, and C, he can't break through. He he can't he can't get to and they they're little they're black ball yeah they'll they'll talk to promoters they'll talk to to street they, they they'll just say we don't want him we well, don't just want to based book on him. your on your history based, based, on, on, your, your history. based on your reputation and it's, stuff it's happened to a lot of people there's um there was a geezer I knew years ago he he was so good at sting, uh, at singing um and sting blackballed him. For, for Sting, Sting, the the singer, the artist. I thought Sting was a hippie and, yeah, and he was all so about a, a peace and love for everybody. I was around my, my friend Terrors and um, in um, in uh, Camden, and he come round and he he basically said, "Sing something." And when this kid opened his mouth, it was like, "Wow!" Yeah, it was like, "Fuck me, he's a Powerful, good singer." Yeah. And I was like, "What are you doing?" It's like I can't do nothing. Sting's blackball me, and I was like, "Why?" And he he was doing some sort of project with him, and because they had a fallout, he basically said. That's no it. one worked with him. Shut you down. And it's such a waste. That's and, a bummer, yeah. And it's it's that control over the scenes, whether it's drum and bass, whether it's R and B, whether it's garage. That the, the top artists control the scene. They control who breaks through and who doesn't. Mm. If they've got it in for you for whatever reason, you ain't gonna get booked. Because if you've got an X Man or you've got a Jay Z saying, I don't want him in here. If he comes in here, I'm in. They're, they're never going to go against them, and, mm. and and it happens. It really does happen. That's bizarre. So when you when you get into MCing, how you just grab a mic off someone? Just someone say, "Get up here, come on, Tony, give us a blast," or what? And and, and, and what's the first time you write something? Do, are you cognizantly are you cognizant of writing something? Are you and what are you writing? Have you specific about it? What's that so go like? You have to whatever scene you want to get into, you have to examine it. Because the problem with a lot of, especially the drill music and, and the R&B, I listen to a lot of these artists, and even though they're different artists, they all sound the fucking same. Yes. And it, that's going on in the R&B scene now. You, you listen to one song, and it's like, well, he sounds like that person. And it's like, well, you're not doing anything to stand out. Yeah. So for me, it was doing something different to what everyone else was doing. So a, a lot of my stuff was humour. It was to put, make something serious, but make something funny. So that when they hear it, it's like, I can't believe you just said that. Oh, but that's funny. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That was my, my avenue in. Yeah. And it's sort of, it. the more you do it, the more opportunities I've got. And it's very addictive. When you walk onto a stage, um, I've done the Let It Roll Festival in, um, oh, I can't remember where it is now. Fucking over by Germany somewhere. I can't remember now. But it's, it's one of the biggest drum and bass festivals in the world. Right. And when you stand there and you're looking at 80,000 people on the main stage, it, it's, it's addictive. It's better than any drug. I was going to say, yeah. Because that... all of them people are looking at you. Yeah. And it, whether you're in Bagley's or Stratford Rex or the O2, when you walk on that stage, that's your moment. That's, you, that's your moment to shine. Mm. And you want to leave an impression so that when them people leave that rave, they're like, do you remember that MC? Do you remember that geezer? And that's how a reputation grows. Now, I've got that reputation not by stabbing someone, not by going and smacking someone in the mouth and going, yeah. look what I've done. I'm by giving people up. energy, man. It's it's a it's a good way. Yeah. It's, it's a legitimate way. Because when you say when you're on your when you're on that stage, you've got that. You say something at the right time, the beat drops. You catch it right. You you're feed. You're literally they're feeding you because wow, look yeah. at these people are just fucking the the bopping, the moving. You're on. You're, that's feeding your energy. You're finding the groove. You're finding the lyric. You're dropping it. They're fucking. You know that that is a. That's a strange exchange, that is. It is, and it, you've only got to get one little catchy lyric 
and people go away and remember it. Mm. I remember the first time I'd done Innovation in the Sun. Um, I was with Lawrence Manchi, um, my old agent, MC Flight, and we're all on the beach, a big group of us, and there was these um, these Scouse girls. And uh, back in the day, we used to have this lyric that went, Hidey, hidey, hi, holdy, holdy, yeah, holdy. Yeah, yeah. And we were on the beach, and all of a sudden, these girls started singing it. And my mate was like, they're singing your lyric. And it's like, it's, it's addictive. You're like, oh, yeah. that's good. And then it, it drives you on to write something else that's catchy. Yeah. And uh, with the thing we're doing now, uh, it's called Rebellion. Uh, so you're active now? Active now. We've um, we've got a music video coming out, hopefully in the next month. Um, we've done the recording, we've just got to do the video. We've got bookings lined up, but because of COVID, we've got to wait. COVID says everything. no. Um, DJ J-Line, DJ Limitless, DJ Max, uh, myself and MC Flight. Um, wow. And it, it's it's going to do well. It will do well. Well, you um, have to send me something because obviously, oh, definitely on this podcast, Tony. When this this video for the YouTube people just goes out as this this conversation, but when it goes out on the Monday, so on a Friday, all these episodes, videos, they premiere at about eight eight o'clock on a Friday. Yeah. But the following Monday, the audio versions go out, and on the audio versions, it's me on the normal podcast, just giving yep. intro and outro, and I play a tune in every time. So I'll use one of your tunes. So yeah, hundred percent. We can send the sang over. And so you're seventeen, eighteen when you start getting into into the, and this correlates with me a little bit because although I wasn't um, locked up and I didn't do jail, lots of my friends did, or they ended up in you know psychiatric units and so on. I was really lucky, um, but I was always in bands as well. Yeah, and I found that the band looking back I didn't really know it at the time because I just loved doing it and that's what I did but looking back it got me out of a lot of scrapes because I was off to rehearsing or I had a gig or I had, focused. I had something like you said at the start yeah. whether it's a boxing club or MMA or whatever I had something that meant like you know I've got to be there at 8 o'clock on Friday because we've got a gig or we've got a rehearse or and even mentally you know like not just not being physically in the place where something's going to go wrong but mentally it gave me looking back I didn't again I didn't know it at the time it gave me Something about writing, there's something about writing lyrics, there's something about yeah. expressing yourself. You mentioned art, you mentioned this music with kids. It's not just something to do. When kids are writing raps, when kids, are, they're expressing themselves. It's a lifestyle. It's an interest. It's yeah. something they can focus on. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. Every kid that writes lyrics, not everyone's going to make it. Not everyone's going to break through in the scene. But what it does do is it leads you on to other things. I yeah. mean, I know, I know people that started off DJing that are now light engineers. And those yeah. opportunities come about yeah. because of their... And you travel the world f- just exactly. the same. You go and look at J-Line. I mean, J-Line, he started DJing. and he, he probably thought, oh, I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. He's doing tours of New Zealand. He's doing tours of America. Mm. Like He bought out a tune. It was one of the biggest tunes in 2015 in drum and bass. Like, and if you were to ask him now, going back, do you think you'd be where you were? Mm. He's obviously going to say no, but because mm. he's stuck at it, he succeeded. Yeah. And that that's what you, you're trying to instill in the kids now is that you can't have everything at once. You have to work for it. You can't be a star tomorrow because you've decided you're going to be an artist We're today. We're up against that though, Tony, with you these fucking phones because these phones, everything now, everything now, the next bird, I'm sick of her. I've got inboxes from 15 nice chicks, nice one, fucking, she's gone. You know, whatever it is, Amazon, get me them, get me this. Like everything's now, isn't it? And that, that that you're talking about there, that earning something, working for it, sticking with it. And I look at them as I look at them as distractions, and I say to to all those kids that watch this podcast that are, are in that that mindset of I'm on plenty of fish, I'm on Insta, I'm on Facebook, I'm getting birds left, right, and centre. I'm going out clubbing every weekend. I'm with my boys. I'm doing my bits on the side and earning my money. For all the energy you're putting into that, someone else is putting the energy into something right. Mm. And they're always going to overtake you. Healthy, her. something healthier, always. something with more longevity, something with more nutrition in it. it is, you, I can't understand. You get a geezer, he goes to a kid, he says, right, here's an ounce of gear. I'll sell it to you for 1,400 quid. You can make this X amount off of it. You're thinking, sweet, because all they're thinking about is the money, not the consequences, nothing. Mm. And a bit of rep as well. Yeah, so now they'll go six months to a year, they think they're untouchable, they're never going to get the door took off, they're undercover, no one's going to know them, even though they're putting Snapchats up and (laughs) buying fucking Rolexes and God knows what else. (laughs) They're doing all this stuff, and then they get nicked. Yeah. And now you're doing four years for intent to supply. That four years you're missing... Someone else yeah. that weren't doing what you was doing has now overtaken you, mm. and then you get released. And what's you want that back? So how do you get it back? 
because in their mindset is it's now too late yeah. to do it the right way. Yeah. So I'm going to carry on doing what I'm doing. Get a shortcut again. But this time I won't get caught. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the mindset. Mm. And it's, I just wish they paid more attention in their interest. If you like gymnastics, if you like athletics, if you like football, go and fucking do it. Mm. You might not succeed, but it will lead on to other things. You could go to a five-a-side football tournament for fucking a year. You won't make it as a professional, but the geezer playing next year has yeah. got his own company and wants to give you a job. I love that. I fucking love that, Tony. I, I've, I've never really been able to articulate that. I've been. This is something I, I try and make this point often, whether it's lads I work with or young people that come into my life. And I, the closest I've got to kind of trying to put it in some kind of metaphor or, or analogy is like, if life is like a corridor yeah and there's doors everywhere and maybe you're spooked by things you don't know what's behind the door i don't want to see it right but you can open a door and you might not like what you see no shut the door carry on you open a door fucking hell this is all right you go in there you go through another door and then before you know it you you you're you're in you can always come back to where you are if you don't if you don't go into the unknown if you don't step out into the unknown you can't there's there's something about being brave. There's something about trusting yourself to. And you said earlier about when you were reading books that you would always go for a, a, a particular style of book. You're going to read, you know, people like the Governor, Lenny McLean, or, or Roy Shaw, and you're going for those kinds of books. Then you've got enough of them books in you where you're starting to think, "Oh, I'm going to try." It all starts to sound the same. Yes. So now I need to try something different. And even though you fucking look at the book, you think, "Oh, Winston Churchill," oh fucking here we go. You're four chapters in, you're like, fuck. And it's not that Winston Churchill's a great guy and he's better than Lenny McLean. It's you've just learned something about yourself. Something new. It's a different you've perspective just gone, oh, on life. Yeah, and now you've unlocked something in you. And I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there when kids have to, young people have to trust that, and this is where the, for me, I know I always come back to social media and digital shit because I'm deep in it at the minute, but that tidal wave of the, the four lads in the car that it used to be yeah. is now fucking everybody you know and mostly people you don't fucking know yeah. that you're trying to impress yeah because out of the fucking 7,000 people on your page you know 120 of them that seems to be the the fucking roadblock for like just trusting to dig in and just stick with something believe in something you just got to trust, trust. It. no it's I have this argument all the time is that all these kids that they want to go out robbing grows they want to go out doing cash points they want to do all these things you have to get lucky every single time you do something. The gathers have to get lucky once and you're banged up. So you have to push the boundaries in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to have the confidence to say, I'm better than these. I've, I've got the ability to do what these are doing. Anyone can go out and fucking blow a cash point up. It ain't rocket science. You've got to lift the latch arm, put gas in and blow it up. It's not rocket science. But you have to want to excel. Mm. You have to want to think, hold on, these are all doing that, but I could do something that none of them can do. Mm. And as soon as they start getting that mindset, they excel. Mm. And as soon as you start excelling, you get different opportunities. And then all of a sudden, you're a million miles away from where these people are. And then you've got someone coming on the phone going, we've got to move for 20 grand. You're like, well, hold on, I earned 15 grand last month. What the fuck am I doing that for? Do you know what I mean? But it's getting them to that point Mm. because... There's too many kids in this country now that believe because they grew up in a poor place, because their mum and dad got a divorce. It's already be- written. Because they ain't got the, I ain't going to amount to nothing. This is what I've got. This is what I've got to do. This is what I'm good at. It ain't what you're fucking good at. You're just doing it because it's what in front of your face. Mm. That's why you're doing it. It's mm. because it's easy. But nothing in life comes easy. It's mm. hard. Mm. Life is hard. It's yeah. a journey. Yeah. But you won't excel unless you think outside of the box. Yeah. And that's what they have to do. You have to push yourself, believe in your dreams, pursue your your careers and your hobbies because it will lead on to other stuff. You won't make it all the time in what you want to do, but it will open other doors up for you to excel at something. I love that, Tony, and I, I, I love it because you might go into something, like you said, you gave the analogy a minute ago about like, you know, you start off as a DJ, but you end up as a light man. It could be argued that being the light man, I mean, I've heard Noel Gallagher say this about when he was a roadie for Inspiral Carpets. He reckons that was the best days of his life because he was doing the world travelling, he was doing all the fun stuff, but nobody knew who he was. Exactly. But, but he was living it. that life. Whereas now he's Noel Gallagher and he fucking can't go anywhere. But, you know, I think young people if, who are watching this 
and I'm sure there'd be a lot of young people because it's you, Tony. Don't be a, don't be scared to to say yes to an opportunity that you might instinctively, without really thinking about it, but say no because the lads will say, "Oh, what?" or you know, or it doesn't seem like it fits with whatever the cool vibe you think it is. Sometimes you say yes to that thing, it will like you say, turn out that you end up shoulder to shoulder with some other dude who's like, oh yeah, I used to be kicking that, but now I'm doing this. And there might be a fucking squeeze for you. You might be able to make, make your way in here. Like it'll work out and we can earn money doing the thing you like, whatever it is. We're making tea in the studio. There's recording. That's where I'm working. You know, we're in a recording studio and there's a, that bands are in it. You know, I mean, my, my main go. theme to my talks, when I go out and talk to the kids, I always start the talk with a phrase and I always say to the kids, because when you first walk into a room, you look into their eyes and you can see the, I don't give a fuckness. You can see it in them. Can, <laughs> I like that you phrase. Can see it, you can sense it. I don't give because, a fuckness. And I can sense it because I once had it. Do you yes. know what I mean? So I can see it. Yeah. And I always start the talk with, I want you to embed this in your fucking brains. Right. I want you to, to remember these words, no matter how old you get, no matter where you end up, whether it's prison, I want you to remember these words. No one fucking cares. And I want you to remember that for one reason, because it's true. No one cares. Mm. If you're a child and you're going out and you're committing offences and you get banged up, your mates, they don't care. They might ring you and write you a letter, but for the rest of the day, they ain't thinking about you. Mm. Your mum and dad love you to bits, but they've got their own lives to lead. They'll think about you often, but they've got to move on with their lives. They don't care. The police officer, the nature, don't give a fuck. The judge, mm. the senator, don't give a fuck. The only person that cares is you. If you don't care about yourself, you ain't never going to go nowhere. And all of these kids, they, they go out and they're in a group of, say, 10 people in, in a group they've been with for a few years and they think they're their family and they're the brethren and they're all going to die for them. <laughs> and all of a sudden, something comes up and it's like, I've got to do what they say, otherwise they're not, they're not going to like me no more. They're not going to accept me no more. Mm. You're talking about 10 fucking people. Yeah. How many, there's, there's 8.5 billion people in the world. Who gives a fuck about them nine people? Mm. What, why is it such a big thing in your life that you care about what these people think, about these people accepting you? And isn't it so ironic that you just said it there again? Like, you know, what do the people think? Nobody cares. Nobody cares, right? And that ain't just them nine lads. It's like even your 7,000 fucking people on whatever, following you on whatever you're on, Instagram, this and that and the other... In the end, you're just another fucking... You're just another You're person. just another fucking Do you know what I mean? I mean, split I've, second of scrolling. I've met you for the first time today, and I, I'll get on with you. I think you're a nice fella. But if I got banged up next week, you'd probably go, oh, Tony got banged up. But would you give a fuck? Not really, because it don't affect you. Yeah, in the, in the, I mean? in the broad light of it, yeah. And you've got your own life to leave. You've got your own kids to bring up. Well, you, we've you talked like, about this, you know, like, I, I've, I've got a fucking... A gang of lads that I, and girls that I grew up with in the area that where I grew up that I don't see no more because I love them, but I can't go and be up there for my own my own mental health, like where where my life trajectory was going. They're fucking eight miles up the road, and I love them, and I've missed opportunities to see them, and and it does my head in, and I battle with it sometimes. But I, I just knew that I had to make the, what you've spoken about tonight, I had to distance myself from where I was because, in fact, you, you kind of outlined my upbringing, to be honest. I, I, I came from a house that, on, on the surface, you would think, oh, you know, they've got it all right. Yeah. You know, but the reality was is that my, my parents' eyes were not on the ball at all, but I would get, reprimanded by them you know because they didn't like me going off where we lived i mean we lived we lived on a perimeter road of an estate so the two of the estates ermine east ermine west my school was on like the main road between the two east and west and my house was on the perimeter road of the east so i went out my back gate and i'm on the playing field of the ermine school which is the estate where I, where I grew up and i loved all my 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 friends from my school where i lived i loved it my mum in particular hated me being on there, but I'm like, well, this is where we live. But then she was not, she wasn't all the things that you've pointed out that are pretty clear, which is, well, be cognizant, be conscious, be aware. You know, if you don't like something like work it out, you don't just send me off, get me out of the way and then bollock me up when I get back because 
I went somewhere you didn't want me to go, but yeah. that's where we live. So I got caught in that whole trap. And then as I, similarly to you, got caught up in later teens, a bit crazy, drugs, crime. I was really lucky, thank fuck, that I didn't end up, you know, in jail. Lots of my friends did. But there came a point when I got into like my mid-20s where I was like, fuck, you know, early mid-20s where I, I started to think, this is, I've got to get away from it. You've got to do something about it. Because I'm going to end up just not getting where I know I need to get, do you know what I mean? And it's not a knock on anybody or anything, it was just me going, right, yeah, I'm not built for this, you know, I'm not built for it. But if you was to walk through your front door, at that point in your life, when the, the possibility of taking the wrong road was there... If you was to walk through your front door and your mum walked into the kitchen and went, listen, we've got to kill the next door neighbour, what would you say to your mum? You're fucking nuts. What are you mm. going on about? Kill them. Mm. But yet these kids are going out and some melon is going, you got to juke him. Mm. You mm. wouldn't do it if your mum said, so why are you doing it for this prick? No, that's a good point. And what makes it even worse is that in London, a lot of it is, is retribution. So you've got the olders that are not on the police radar yet. They're, they're doing their thing. They're moving boxes. They're earning their money. Yep. Underneath them, they've got their lieutenants or they've got their runners. So they've got the people that are dishing it out to the different people that are flogging it. And then they're collecting the money. Now, that lower tier is their job to spot potential talent. Now, all of a sudden, this kid comes up to you. He's 15, 16, and he's like, do you like these trainers? Do you like that car? Do you like that bird? I'll do you a favour. I'll lay you on this gear. Yeah. You sell it, but I'm only doing it as a favour. I'll lay you on this gear. You sell it. You bring me back this month. You can keep that. These kids are convinced that this prick is doing them a favour. They ain't doing you a favour. You're doing them a fucking favour. Mm. And then they're going back to their boss and they're giving them the money and they're like, can't get someone else. And this is what the kids don't realise. All of these fucking melons that are running around selling apes of fucking skunk, grams of Charlie, bags of crack, bags of brown, you're doing it all to feed that man at the top. Mm. And believe you me, when you get nicked, he ain't coming to fucking visit you. He ain't sending you no money. He ain't looking after your mum and dad because you're expendable. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not even that. You're, you're, just you're, you're replaceable. yeah. yeah. But they will make it. They make that individual believe that you're part of something. You're part of this group. You're strong. No one can fuck with you. You're with us. But then when the shit hits it, a fan, where are they? Mm. Like, please tell me where they are. And I don't mean in regards of you getting someone ringing your phone saying I'm coming onto the estate. Then you're ringing your mates and all your mates are turning up. Now one of your mates stabbed that kid to death. Now where are all your mates? Yeah. Because no one wants to be around your house. No. Because the cell site from your phone leads it straight to the victim. Yeah. No cunt wants to be around you. No. And then you get nicked and you get in 16 years. Where are they all then? Mm. And it's, I, I just, I, it, I, I find it, I get so angry that these kids' lives are just being fucking wasted. Like Tony, I I, I've got to jump in there because what's fascinating me about you, and it did when I watched you on, when I came across you on the internet and that, and it is, I've been spent tonight with you. You've lived this life in a dual way. You, and you said it yourself in the car. Half my brain saying this, half my brain saying that. For you to have this energy and this power and this way of articulating this, you know, it's in you. It must have been in you the whole time. So at some point during your... Is it, is it just maturing? At what point when you were in your 20s, I mean, you're in your later 30s now, you haven't been in, in trouble for, what, a decade? About 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So... In your 20s, let's say, there's a point in your 20s where the one side of the brain gets the better of the other and says, hang on a minute, I'm fucking better than this. All this advice that you're clearly laying down, which is not out of a book, it's like from your experience. You're saying, look, we've got to think. That's your movement, you know, think first. There must have been a battle. With, did you have nights in jail? Did you have moments where you were thinking, fuck, what is going on? You do, you just, you just wake up. I mean... My upbringing was no different to a lot of these other kids. These kids grow up and there's always a Mr. Big. There's always that one individual that you aspire to be. Yeah. And But you can't get close to them. You, ca you can't get into their inner circle. And then for whatever reason, for an association or an opportunity, you get an avenue into that circle. And by getting that avenue into that circle, Mr. Big plays you five minutes of attention and goes... 
all right, mate, you're you're good, you are. Do you want what I've got? Like, this is what you could have. This is what you've got to do. And it, all of a sudden, all of that that positivity and that encouragement is all focused into that one individual. Mm. Now, if you had a fucking brain, you'd wrap that cunt up and rob him. Brilliant. I'm being serious. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to go and do all of these things For to impress him. this one individual yeah. to get what he's got. Yeah. But looking back, I should have just fucking wrapped you up. Yeah. You had it all. I should have just fucking took it off you. Yeah, just gone straight to source. But it don't happen like that. No. Because he's protected. You can't piss him off because by pissing him off, you piss off these five. The army. And then these five send these lot to your house. So you can't do that. So then you're having to climb the ladder. You're having to work your way in. And then by the time you get close, you've been fucking nicked. Mm. And now they've all gone. Mm. And then you come to the realisation of, well, that didn't work. Now what am I going to do? And it's like, and a lot of these kids, they come out and they move to another group or they move to another area. And the, the, the easiest circles to infiltrate when you're a youth in the local areas are criminals because they're the ones hanging about out over the parks. They're the ones hanging about outside the shops. These are the people you see. The ones you don't see are the ones studying in their bedroom for their degree or they're going to college every day or they're going to university or they're doing apprenticeships. You don't see them, so to you, they don't exist. Yeah. That life doesn't exist. All that exists is what you can see, this life. There's no way out of it. And it, I, I, I just don't know how to, to get it across to people. that If you ask any legitimate criminal that has been to prison, that has got an ounce of intelligence, and you ask them, what would you say sums prison up? Anyone with intelligence will tell you it's a waste of fucking time. It's mm. a waste of life. Because all that time you're in there doing nothing, you could have been outside doing something. But these kids still do it. Because they believe I won't get caught, I won't get nicked. If you think, as a 16 to 25 year old individual, that you are more intelligent than the fucking police force, you are thick as shit. I tell you that to your face now, yep. you're thick. Mm. They have got so many avenues of nicking you now. And today, 2020. And today, it was hard enough when I was a teen. Now, I just think, what is the... You've got fucking AMPRs, you've got cell site, you've got bugs, you've got social media. They can get you each and any way they want. Mm. But they're still sitting there thinking, they ain't on me. Mm. I change my phone every week. And it's like, what are you thinking? But your Facebook account's still the same. <laughs> Let me tell you something, yeah? <laughs> and this is, this is going back to when I, when I was bang at it, yeah? Right. We got told that there was a van down the road. And Mr. Big come to us and he said, I need you to yog this van. I need you to burn this van out. And we're like, what the fuck do you want to burn this van out for? And he's like, listen, we need to burn this van out. I was like, why? And he's like, there's something in the back of it. And I was like, what, is it alive? What, 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 why are we doing it? He said, listen, there's a grand. Go and yog the van. So now my brain's ticking. Yeah. What the fuck is so important about this van? So he gets to this van and there is a device in the back of this van, right? It's about this round and it comes out like a mushroom and it's sat in the back of this van. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is that? If they're on you, they can park a van or a car down your road and they put one of these devices in the back of it. It collects all of the mobile, mobile phone data within a certain area. Well, uh, literally, like of, the cloud of, of just drags phone. it in. Just, anyone that makes a phone call is collecting the data. Whoa. So now, Mr. Clever Cunt, that's got five phones... He now goes to Nando's with his birds. And now the undercovers, and believe me, if you've got the attitude of, oh, I'd fucking see him, no, you won't. <laughs> you won't have a fucking clue. So now you're in Nando's with your kids and your bird. You start making calls from one of your phones. Clever cunt is outside on his laptop, and he's picking up all the mobile phone signals that are in the vicinity. What you do is you come out, you get in your car, you drive away with your five phones. Those five signals... I'll go in with you, yeah. away from everyone else. Now, you at this point haven't got a fucking clue they're on you, but now they've got all of your numbers. So now they're listening, they're viewing texts, they, they might even bug your phone. Then what you're doing is you're ringing your mate and saying, right, ring your mate up, I need two boxes. So then you ring your mate, now they've got his number. Then he rings his mate the and web. says, I need two boxes, now they've got his number. Six months later, all your doors come off. But because you're a clever cunt, 
and you're 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 clever than the old Bill, you go into the interview and you're like, got rid of the phones. You get on the but I ain't got no fucking no comment. Fuck you. I ain't, you ain't getting me for nothing. And then they put this big chart on the table yeah. with all these photos of all your friends, with all these lines connecting you all together. And they're like, we know that was your phone because we had you under surveillance and that phone was used exactly where you was. Oh. And then you went to your mum's house and then another call was made. You ain't, it's a conspiracy. You ain't getting out of it. You, mm. you are banged to rights. No jury in the land is going to believe, oh, that ain't my phone. They're mm. not going to believe it. You're fucked. Mm. But these kids think... Nah. They can get past it. They think, I'm not that big that they're going to be on me. Not important. They don't see the bigger picture. When when the police want to take out a syndicate or, or, or a criminal fraternity, they're not going for the runners, they're going for Mr Big. And once they've got Mr Big, they will then nick everyone underneath them because it's like you have to take the head off the snake. Of course. And once you do that, you just nick as many people underneath as you can. You might not get a big sentence if you're right at the bottom... But the police ain't stupid. They're not thick. Mm. They know for a fact you're going to do your year and you're going to come out and go and move on to some other cunt. But because you're cleverer than the old Bill and you only got a little sentence and they can't be on me now, bruv. Like, I only got 12 months. But now they're on you anyway. They know where you live. So now they're monitoring you. They, they want to see now you, who you're getting your gear off. And then it moves on to the next operation. So if you look at recent and current events, the Encro phones. So somebody that was intelligent, come up with an idea that I can take a normal iPhone or a BlackBerry and I can encrypt that phone so that when you send a text or an email, it deletes it from the main servers. So anyone that's been nicked with a mobile phone knows that even if you delete the messages and delete your voicemails, they can get them back because they're getting it from the main server. So even though it's not in your phone, it's yeah. in the server. It's imprinted on yeah. the server. So the encrypted phones meant that it wasn't on the server. It, it, it was deleted. There was no trace to it. Now... I remember years and years ago, there were Blackberries that done the same thing. And the rumour was that it was the government that implemented these phones into circulation. Yep. Now, if you, if you use your brain, it's a very, very clever move on the government's part. They want to know how drugs are getting into the country. They want to know how murders are being arranged. They want to know how drugs are being imported into the local areas, who's running them, who's, how you're laundering the, the, the proceeds of the crime. So for the government, it's an extremely intelligent move by yeah. saying... Here's a phone. A specific detail for you lot to use. Exactly. And then you know you exactly. You can get away with it. Now, what I don't get is, is that all of these top tier criminals, they get these phones and they convince themselves, oh no, they, these phones are safe. No phone is safe. No, no electrical device is safe. It's, none of it is non-hackable. Now, what happened was, the, the rumour that I've heard is that there was someone in Greece that was like a, a whiz kid, like a computer hacker. And he actually hacked in to the servers. And once he realised what he had, he then went and sold the information to, to the governments in Europe and then it was passed on to England. That's a sign of the times, selling what, the information. And then what they done was exactly what I'm saying about how they sit and watch. They, they had access to the devices and the, the producers of the phones, they knew because there was malware on the devices, so they knew an outside source had come in. Now, instead of the police being impatient, because remember, the old bill thick, they ain't got a clue, right? Yeah, yeah. So what they done was they sat for six months and they just watched. They let everything carry on as normal and they're watching how everything moves about, who's involved, who's got what, who's holding the money, who's... Because the biggest problem the police has got is that they might make Nick Mr Big... But where's the money? Mm. So you bang him up, it's coming out to the money. You can put a proceeds of crime on him, but does he give a fuck? Not really, because he's still got the dough. So what they've done was they watched, and now you're seeing 30 tonne of gear seized, all this money seized, people that are normal law-abiding citizens getting nicked. Now, if these top-tier criminals couldn't work this out, what fucking hope have you got as an 18-year-old thinking you're clever? Mm. These are people with millions of pounds. And believe me, there is not a big criminal in Europe at the moment that is not shitting himself that was using them phones mm. because they know it's coming and they, they know it's coming do you know what I mean even the mafia used to say didn't they you never write anything down back in the day you never write anything down and I think even when they did send notes they got passed through fucking hand to hand through villages through towns and then burned yeah. but the idea was you never wrote anything down it was just literally you used to write on a bit of paper and they burn it yeah and now everyone's using these phones, these phones. And, and thinking that, oh, yeah, this one's sound. 
and, and don't get me wrong, even though they've disrupted the, the main criminal fraternity, crime is like a virus. It, it, it grows. It doesn't matter what laws or what implementations the government put in place, criminals will find a way around them, which opens new doors to new criminality. Mm. That, that's a fact of life. Mm. But the, the point of it is, is that it's a time bomb. You, you, you might be doing what you're doing now and getting away with it. You might convince yourself that they're not on you. You might convince yourself that you've got an end goal. You're, I'm going to get to a million quid and I'm going to come away. But the problem is, is that once they're on you, and it's not always you, it, it, it's always someone else that yeah. brings them on to you. Yeah. And I, I've, I've never got, I had so many opportunities as a kid. Just to, bring your mark into them. I had so many opportunities as a kid to get given gear and to go and sell it and to earn a profit and, and earn a good profit. But my way of thinking was, is that if I get an ounce of gear and I go and sell that in point fours, I've got to see, what, 50 people, 60 people? Yeah. It takes fucking one of them to get nicked. Yeah. Now, this is, how, this is how thick the police are. Geezer that works at Canary Wharf that's never had a criminal conviction in his life, that's got a career to lose, a family that might find out that he's doing drugs, he gets nicked and goes into an interview room and the CID walk in and they go, we'll let you go. Who'd you get it off? If you think that geezer ain't opening his mouth, you're fucking stupid. Mm. And now they're on you. And you've got 50 of those. It's a law of averages. Someone's mm. going to open their mouth. Mm. And you can have all the bravado in the world. If you grass me up, I'll fucking do this. Listen, when you're sat in a cell, you ain't doing nothing. And believe it or not, when you're sat in that cell and you're telling three others to go around and then risk their liberty, a lot of the time it's going to be like, yeah, we do it, we can do it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And don't get me wrong, there are gangs in London that are very dedicated. If someone gets pinched and someone's grasped them up, they will go through the door. Mm. But again, it's to what end? Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your goal? All right, you shut that one up, but then someone else is going to open their mouth. What are you going to do? Do you keep killing people? Mm. Like, you keep killing people, you're going to have no one left to sell drugs to. Do you know mm. what I mean? It, it, it don't make no sense to me. Mm. It's like, it's just an, a, a circle that just keeps going round and round. And it's just pointless. It it's is. just absolutely It's fucking pointless. crazy. And... Again, we'll get back to the, the positive of your future because with the Think First campaign and with your appearance on podcasts, I know with what you did with Sean and, you know, hopefully here we're going to get some views as well and some, some young boys and girls will be watching and we'll maybe, because I believe people like you, and I've said it several times during this podcast now, you are the people that they're going to listen to because you've got the scars, you've been there, you've done 16 weeks fucking trying not to go insane in a fucking you know, segregation. You've 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 clearly talked about like the pros and the cons and Darren G said a similar thing. Is it goes uphill at first, you know, and then it goes down there after that. But you know the biggest problem with everything at the moment, and this is a this is a big thorn in my side, um it's the Epstein case. Right. And I say the Epstein the case. A thorn in your side. It's a thorn in my side because you have to remember the Queen runs the country, it's her country. Now, right. she employs people like the Prime Minister and the government to make the, the decisions to run the country in the most efficient way possible. They want to earn profit for the economy. They want everyone to benefit from that as a straight goer. Now, you're sending police officers to kids' houses and you're arresting them in front of their family because they've done wrong. You, you committed in a criminal offence, you have to be punished for it. Now, the source of that prosecution starts with the Queen. Everyone acts on behalf of the Queen. Now, for me growing up, the Queen is like the ultimate mother figure. She's like the mother of all mothers. Yeah. yeah? Now, everyone knows that people have kids that kill people. But do you stop loving your kid? Of course you don't. Mm. Not unless it's something internal in the family. No matter what your kid does, you're always going to love them. Now, for me, how can you as an individual with that amount of responsibility know full well that your son is a fucking wrong'un in Prince Philip. Everyone knows he's a fucking wrong'un. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not hidden away. The evidence is there. Well, they've started to expel him from their... their Just you know. so, your son is a wrong'un. Now, there has to be a point, and it, you hear it all the time about families where they find out the kid uh, has murdered someone and they themselves hand them into police yeah. because they feel that they have to be prosecuted for what they've done and learn their lesson. Why is she not making a stand by saying, I'm royalty, I am the queen, but 
he's done fucking wrong and he's got to pay for it. Like everyone else that commits a criminal offence. And ends up in Her Majesty's. Pay. And I am flabbergasted yeah. that a nonce has not walked into a courtroom yet and mm. had the defence of, well, Prince Philip done it. Mm. Why ain't he been nicked? All right, I'm, I'm bang to rights, but why ain't he been nicked? Mm. And for me, it then filters down. And the message that you're sending out is, it's all right for them, but it ain't all right for you. Of course. And then that breeds an yeah. attitude Contempt. of, fuck you, fuck the establishment. Yeah. Why yeah. is it you can get away with it and we can't? Yeah. And that, for me, is, is, is very you, disheartening. That, that, I've heard that said. I, I, forget, I don't know who said it, but it stuck with me. Some, some writer or philosopher that when... When we end, when we find ourselves in a state of contempt, there's there is not a lot of return from there. There's you not. don't you don't return from there, and that does. And and right now, the Epstein case, which the mainstream media seem to just be skirting by, you know, and kind of because I think Ghislaine Maxwell at the moment, obviously, she's the scapegoat. She's going to be the scapegoat. It's going to be we've given her this sentence, problem solved. But it ain't the problem solved, is it? I believe that. No matter how rich you are, no matter how influential you are, if you commit an offence, you have to pay for it the same as everyone else. Mm. Because what makes you different? And just because you've got a lot of money... Well, if you built the fucking place, then you've got the blueprint, haven't you? But it's wrong. It's, and I, I don't agree with it. Ah, I, totally. I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. And I love what Sean's doing on Sean Atwood's... Again, Sean Atwood, powerful Sean Atwood and the True Crime podcast and his wider stuff on the channel he's got over 300 videos on the Epstein case oh, it's brilliant I mean this geezer in Russia um, have you seen the videos on the geezer in Russia I've seen a couple um, I mean that for me is is going to be the catalyst because this individual that was the Florida um, deputy sheriff that's right Yeah. he basically ran away to Russia now he is saying that there are discs um, in circulation that he has got and he's very clever because what he's done is he's encrypted the discs he's given the discs to certain people that are unassociated to him and the key to the encryption to other people so even though they're all spread out they're useless without each other Yeah. now what he's saying is if anything happens to me or anything happens to my family these discs are going to come to light now what he's saying is, is that he's got footage of not only Prince Philip but other celebrities mm. doing these things with children now, for me, it, when that eventually comes out, and I, I believe it will eventually, mm -hmm. all these people need to be prosecuted. Because if you don't, you're setting yourself up for a fall. That that point we're at now, the tipping point we're at now, and I don't want to get all COVID on it, but like clearly there's a lot of movement universally now in the West, certainly, yeah, with Black Lives Matter, um, censorship, fucking the whole COVID thing, the Epstein thing. I think we're at a point when information is going to come out and that to me if you look at if you spend enough time and again I'll send you to Sean's channel and look at the Epstein stuff because he's covered it phenomenally from day one there is so much there that that points to if if someone I think they're, they're fighting at the moment I think Maxwell's lawyers they're all fighting at the moment for the for a lot of information to not come out during her trial so of she's actually she's fighting at the moment for this genuine factual information that's already there in the case to not come out and when that comes out i think it plays into everything else that's happening but it shows you the level of corruption that yeah it's because at. it's at the highest point and i think when when it falls from that height and you're talking the crown as you've said you know then the fucking lid is off the lid is off but they're who we look up to apparently you're the pinnacle of society in britain mm. so if we can't trust you who the fuck can we trust that's why we've got so much unrest and, and all this talk ridiculous. we've done about jails at the end of the day jails business it's a business so all of these routes to and what are prisons called hmps her hey. majesty's prisons yeah and you've got all them people sitting in cells they're watching all of this saga unfold and if if i'm sitting in a cell and i'm thinking well hold on why is it all right for you to do it, but not all right for me to do it? Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it, and then it, the content breeds and it then does, it, it, it spreads quickly. And all of a sudden, at some point, people are going to turn around, whether you're a criminal or not, and say, do you know what? Fuck this. Something's got to change. Mm. And it, I, I believe everything in this country is set up for certain individuals from certain backgrounds to excel whereas those opportunities aren't afforded to the lower classes. And yeah. I think that's a major problem in this country. And we're at the point as well, I think, where, like, the bell curve of that, like, we're... we're and Aiden, producer Aiden, just read a book that I read earlier this year, uh, Sapiens, 
which is quite a chunky book and it kind of documents our rise from single cell organisms right up until now and, and he, he talks about capitalism he talks about infinite growth and like we've almost hit the point now with money with our currencies where it's all spent we're printing money now for fucking for money's sake and just and it's like we're at the point where it's just plateaued and there's nothing more we can do with it it's now it's now a like a broken system and i don't mind saying that this situation we're finding ourselves in at the moment where the world's locked down and the economy conversations happening i think a lot of this stuff that's happening is because we are it's all cum- accumulating like yeah. you said top of the tree you know epstein the whole thing is kind of playing out and it's playing out on the internet. The only reason that we're aware of all this is because we've got this internet. And although we've talked about it tonight in the sense that it's pushing kids to be kind of trying to please what once was four kids in a car, the four lads that they're kicking with who they want to impress, who's the toughest, who's the maddest, who's the funniest, is now 10,000 people on your own page. It's fucking 700,000 views on his page. Like this whole internet, the information, the connectivity, the unraveling of everything. It's almost like we've got behind the curtain yeah. of what the fuck's going on. And it's just fireworks are going off now. Shit's brooding. And you mentioned it there again. People at that contempt's breeding. I think that's happening now where people are really thinking, hang on a minute. Sank ain't right. What is fucking happening right now? And We're locked in our houses and I can't go and see me fucking sister in her house you know up I mean? the road. But this is what fucking annoys me. I went, to, um, I went to a beach, like a private beach with my partner and the kids. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, there's a fucking drone in the air. And all of a sudden, the drone starts talking. You all have to leave. COVID-19 no restrictions. No way. And I'm looking, and I'm thinking, what the fuck? So I walked up to the police officer, and I said, why have we got to leave? Because of the risk of spreading the virus. And I said, I said okay, okay. I said, so I'm on a beach. There's, there's got to be a few hundred people here. So it's not all right for me to be here in case I spread the virus. But when I get on the tube to go to work tomorrow, that's all right. Mm. When I'm packed like a fucking sardine on the tube on the underground with thousands of people, that that's all right, is it? Chaos. Because obviously I'm feeding the economy by working. Mm. But I believe that as a human race, no matter where you're from, we learn and evolve by things that have happened in the past. Now, to me, the two biggest fuck-ups in criminal history... Number one in America, the prohibition of alcohol. Yeah. What you done there is you give the mafia a license to print fucking money. Yeah. That was that was your fuck up. And, and that still, whole system and of you're still paying for it now. Yeah. The whole system of making something taboo just backfired. Exactly. In this country, it was the Great Train robbery. The Great Train robbery happened, and they got on the fucking train with a bat. It's a fucking baton. They hit the driver over the head, and you went and gave him fucking thirty years. So you basically told every criminal in the fucking UK that if you're going to do something, you might as well take a shooter because you're going to get 30 years anyway. Mm. So what you made, you made criminality jump from a level of seriousness to a, a level that was out of control. Yeah. And this is why we've got from hitting someone in the face because they've done wrong to now we've got to stab them. Because mm. it's like, mm. if you're going to get 13 years for a GBH, fuck me, I might as well kill him and get 15. It, it, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Mm. It does not make sense. Mm. And these are all mistakes that the governments of different countries ha- have made. You look at Mexico now with the cartels, oh. and it's like, how the fuck have you let it get like that? Well, I think about when I think about Mexico, and you know, there's a, there's plenty of documentaries out there about the war on drugs now. And anybody who you know is in, interested should go to Netflix and just search, you know, whatever it may be. There's plenty of documentaries. But if you, when I watch those 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 documentaries about the war on drugs in Mexico in particular, which is kind of taken over from Colombia, I guess, in the sort of 80s, 90s. You look at it and you think, what? Because people ultimately just want to change how they feel for a bit. For a fucking after work, they just want to be able to either, you know, we can, we can drink this all day fucking long. And this is linked to over 5 million deaths a year. And that's just direct consequence. Never mind all the psychological... You can smoke cigarettes. We can do all these things. But if you want to smoke some weed or you want to... Oh, I'm, not doing, a, I'm doing something wrong. Have a tipple on this or that. It's the, it's the, it's the idea that it's criminalised that just feeds this mental underbelly of Mexico where you look and you watch these people are machine gunning each other at fucking 11 o'clock in the morning over the fact that someone somewhere just wants to feel different for fucking 20 minutes, an hour, a night. That's crazy if you look at the entity of progression if you look at the basics like space what is space forever doing it's expanding so it's reaching a point where it can't do anything else but get bigger Mm. you can put that into the drug game 
It mm. doesn't matter how big they get, they want to be bigger. Mm. Now, at the end of this COVID scenario, they're going to turn around and they're going to go, we've got to put the price of all the taxes up because we're in debt. Yeah. Now, you're a government. You're meant to be financially stable in the decisions that you make for the economy in, in Britain. Now, you've got all of these people making billions. It's not millions. It's billions of pounds. B. Off of drugs, whether it's crack, whether it's skunk, whether it's coke. Now, are you fucking stupid as to not to think that all of these people are buying them? So a lot of people are doing them because if they weren't, these people wouldn't be getting rich. Mm. Now, for me, if I'm running a country, I'm thinking, well, hold on a minute. Why are they getting the fucking money? I'll tell you what, legalise a lot. Mm. By legalising everything... And you'll have attitudes of people that don't do drugs going, why would we legalise it and give it to them? Everybody will take drugs in anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the difference is, is you're feeding and funding criminality yeah. instead of feeding the economy in your own country. Mm. So instead of all of the politicians and the different MPs of the local areas saying, right, we've now got an extra seven million to build a youth centre or to build a new college. There's a drug dealer going, buying a Lambo, buying a Roly. Yeah. Where, where's the logic? Mm. You can't say to me by legalising drugs, you're doing something wrong. Everyone is buying them anyway. The only difference is you're funding the wrong thing. Yeah. And as a result, all of these kids are now running around stabbing each other to death. Yeah, it's, it, we've got to learn this lesson soon. I'd like to think if there is anything positive to come out of this reset new normal, whatever the fuck they're selling it in a headline, in a tabloid to us as. If we really are resetting, we've got, that has got to be a fundamental change. We've got to look at it and treat it as a, as a reality, like every fucking thing else, you know. But it's like you said about, about smoking, about about drinking. You've got, you've got the higher classes that have never been arrested in their lives and they'll sit down and watch a podcast like this and they'll go, oh, he's a criminal, what, mm. what does he know? Mm. And I would say to you, well, hold on, what are you doing now watching this? You're drinking a glass of wine. Mm. That glass of wine is a drug. The only mm. difference is you're paying tax on it. Mm. Now at the weekend, I'll go and roll a joint. What makes me worse than you? It's still a drug. Yeah. It's still causing harm to your body. Mm. What does drink lead to? But you say that, but I mean, if you look at marijuana as, as a clean as a clean substance, as in, you know, no tobacco, whatever, you know, smoked directly, then it's, it's, a, it's fucking very difficult to find, other than psychosis in young people and in some people, the broad, the, the by and large comparison of alcohol damage to a marijuana damage is fucking worlds apart. Worlds apart. Yeah. And so, f I mean, I remember my mum ringing me up one night and saying to me, I was like 17, I was in Tesco's. I had a friend in Tesco's who worked in Tesco's and she used to let us just fucking fill the trolley and she'd scan like every 10th item. So we'd be like a couple of trolleys, me and my mate who lived together and we'd have probably 300 quid's worth of gear in these trolleys. She'd charge us like 60 quid. And I remember filling up my trolley with my bag at the till, like having a laugh with my friend at the till. And my mum rings me up and she said, you know, I've heard that you, um, someone's just told me that you've taken drugs and you're blah, blah, blah. And, blah. and I, I remember I was 17 I, I thought, I'm just going to fucking tell her. I've always gone with the truth, you know. I tell her the truth. I'm I'm not a bad lad, you know. I've done crazy things, but I'm I'm always trying to earn my own money. I'm trying to find the right ways. And I just said, yeah, I do, yeah. I, I smoke marijuana. I said, I, I was drinking and getting into all sorts, and now I just sit with my mate and we we talk about space and we talk mad stuff and we have a pizza and I fall asleep. And I said, and I don't feel like that that's an issue. I don't feel like that's a problem. I'm not going to lie to you about it. And then I got fucking... You know, and it all went and I was a drug addict and of this and of that and painted a picture of me as this completely just irresponsible fucking criminal of a person because of, and I choose, chose to be honest because I could have perpetuated that and lied about it and gone on and on and on and, you know, that's where we are. It's fucking ludicrous. People work hard. We live in a, in a, in a, in a society and in a culture where the momentum of the decisions that have got made long ago at this point, a, con a, a dictating where we're at. And if you want to have a drink after work, you should be able to have a drink after work. If you want to have a stogie after work, you should be able to have a stogie after work. Should be able, but the, the, the argument is, and the, the government will always say, well, if we legalised it, what would happen is the criminals would then rob it from the places that we're supplying to sell it legally and send it a, uh, sell it at a lesser price. So it would still create that black market. But then I say this, what penalty have you got for murdering someone? 15 years in prison. 
sweet. So I'll tell you what we do. We'll legalise drugs. And if you're arrested buying drugs from a dealer that is not a recognised dealer, we'll life you off. How many people are going to go to dealers? Mm. And you're telling me you haven't, as a government, you haven't got the ability to do that. Mm. I'm not being funny. If, if we're sat in L and it's legal and we've got to go to the local 24-hour chemist to buy our eight for weed, or you're risking a life sentence and going up the end of the road and meeting a geezer in an escort to bite <laughs> off him, uh, what one are you going to pick? Who lets you down? Where the fuck is he? Do you know he? what I mean? So <laughs> it, it, it takes that away from it. Yeah, cool. And then they're earning a the tax on it, and then it, it boosts the economy, and then you're able to give, especially kids, better opportunities as they're growing up. But they won't do it. And mm. I'll tell you why they won't do it. It's because crime is a fucking business. Mm. On both ends. How many people are employed in prisons? How many probation officers? How many barristers? How many solicitors? Mm. How many governors? Like How many police officers? So if you take crime away, what are they going to fucking do? Everything folds in on itself. But do you remember what I said about how crime evolves? Even if they was to legalise every single drug on earth and you could legally get it and the sentences were so vast that you wouldn't dare go and get it from anywhere but where you was meant to get it from. Something else would come up. Well, I think that's what's happening. And we mentioned this earlier, didn't we, about everything digitising now and a lot of fraud. fraud and a lot is of one of the, it's, it's one of the biggest data, growing crimes information, in, in the world. Information is now, it's key for the, for the big corporations, the Facebooks, the vaccine companies. Everybody wants our data, everybody wants our movements to predict our behaviour, to, to be able to, number one, you know, profitise it. And number two, control it. And you're right, it would move into some other area. But it's pretty clear from 1970 to now, the war on drugs oh, yeah, They lost didn't it work years out. ago. They didn't lost, work out. And all you achieved by the war on drugs was enriching criminals mm. and funding criminality. Mm. That, that, that's all they achieved. Creating, all that bollocks about oh, George Bush. Oh, was it George Bush? No, it was George Bush, wasn't it? No, it wasn't George Bush. Who was the one that said, whose wife just said, just say no? Oh, you're Nancy Reagan. Yeah, it's yeah. like, no, it don't work like that. No. Um, Me when she a went lot out. of them said no and then done lying. Do you know yeah, what I mean? was going to so, say, yeah, she'd gone back home and got all, well, yeah. They, they, they lost the war on drugs. And I tell you, I've never heard, it's like we sit here and we talk about all these different views and perspectives and you never hear the right people backing you up. Mm. And there is a case um, in America, White Boy Rick. You, you aware of White Boy Rick? White Boy Rick. Go on Netflix and watch the documentary on White Boy Rick. It is the prime example of what I've been talking about. He was a little kid. He got mixed up with a Mr. Biggs. And when it all came on top, they, they put him as, as the main figure. And he got fucking God knows how many years he served in prison. And what happened was... The, um, you know the film Beverly Hills Cup? Mm. You know the person that plays the sergeant, Eddie Murphy? Yes. So a lot oh, of people, I've heard something about this. A lot this. of people don't know that he, in real life, was an actual sergeant That's, in the police force. Yes. And he later come, went on to become governor or something like that. And every time white boy Rick put in um, uh, they shut for him a court off, didn't case, they? They, they shut him off. Mm. They, he, he just couldn't get out. Yeah. And it was the first time that I'd seen a district judge in America turn around and go, this ain't right. What's happening to this kid ain't right. He, he never done nothing to deserve. He got arrested and got something like 80 years or something ridiculous. And there was people in the same circle that had murdered fucking 17 people and were now out. The geezer had never hurt anyone. Do you know what I mean? But mm. he's still, Because he was the scapegoat, just like he, he's the Maxwell. Do you know mm. what I mean? Mm. And it was the first time I'd heard a judge turn around and go, do you know what? This ain't right. And Let's look into to, it. Yeah. And I don't know why. And it, it, this is what I find hard to comprehend is that we've got... All of these MPs, and it, you can relate the MPs in Parliament to the kids on the block, where the kids are doing what they need to do to be accepted in that circle. It's the same thing going on in government. It's like, I'm here, I've achieved the status, and I'm, I'm an MP, I'm in, I'm in the House of Commons, I'm making decisions, but I can't say that, and I can't have that view, because mm. I'll be outed. Mm. And that's what fucks me off. It really fucks me off, because mm. I want these people that have got degrees, they're intelligent people. I want these people to stand up and say, do you know what? Enough's a fuck enough. You've all been doing it the way you've been doing it for years and it hasn't worked. And what you're doing is wrong and it needs to change. And we need more MPs that are going to be brave like that because that is what will cause change in government. And until that happens, everything will stay the same. I think that's playing in now. I think we're seeing that to a degree now with this virus movement, with this pandemic that... Average people now, even NHS staff, uh, teaching staff, you know, everyday people, let's call them the silent majority normally, 
are starting to say, hang on a minute, this is disproportionate. This is not fitting. And they are starting to stand up and we need to see more. I think Andy Burnham, the, the mayor of Manchester, who's, you know, controversial character because he's got ties into bigger uh, enterprises that look at global globalisation and stuff. But he stood up, you know, this week and said, look, hang on a minute, you can't just fucking break us like this. So you're right, you're bang on it. We've got to stand up. I hope that whatever this situation we're in at the minute, this pandemic, in quotes, is going to trigger something that makes us, if we are resetting, let's reset at least with some things moving in the right direction. But I would like to say to you, Tony, at this point, you know, as you move forward, you're talking to the kids, you've mentioned that tonight, so you're, obviously, we're in COVID times, you can't get out and do what you're doing, but I guess, are you going to schools, are you talking to people in colleges, what's the future looking like? Well, we, we was on the verge of setting up um, a UK tour in universities and colleges to go around and do these talks, but because of the restrictions, we can't do that. Mm. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm working with selected groups, so I'm doing a talk next Friday with um, a, a group of kids, that have all come from them sorts of backgrounds where they've suffered from abuse, where they've got involved in criminality at an early age. And I get the opportunity to try and persuade them away from what they're doing. But you, you kind of fight in a losing battle because it worries me that now I, I believe that even though I've committed offences in my life, I don't believe that makes me a bad human being. I just believe it means that I made bad decisions at that time in my life. Now, the problem is, is that my views don't count for shit because they, you might impact on certain children that you're talking to, but at the very highest level, you're looked at as nah. Do you know what I mean? And it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult. And I've always said that there, I think the biggest problem in any country is greed. I think yeah, human problem. It's, it's, it's greed, and it's it's a it's a natural instinct to mm. want more. Every mm. everyone wants more. It doesn't matter how much you've got; you always want more. And I believe, as a society and as a human race, there's only a certain need to have so much. And I mean, you look at people like Mark Zuckerberg, you look at the Queen, you look at the, the, the ex presidents. These are like some of them are like fucking billionaires, and it's like, what are you gonna do with it? You don't fucking need it. Well, power takes over at that point, and this, doesn't it? This is what I'm saying. And I've always said there should be a cap. And if you've got a business or you've got um, something that's successful that generates money, I believe there should be a limit. There should be like a, a, a two billion limit. If you fall below your your two billion, then you're allowed to reaccumulate it back. But anything you earn after that, your should, instincts are spot should go on. back into the society. Your instincts are spot on because that's what what like I say, Aidan pointed out to me, and I didn't pick up on it so much, but in a direct way, but that's what he's saying in Sapiens, you know, is that we have reached the point where that infinite growth, that striving for the thing has got to the point where average kids like us are looking yeah. at it going, this is fucking, think about football. Premier League is a good example, right? Look at the young lads now. What do you expect a 17 year old lad, yeah, to do who maybe he came from a little town like Lincoln, a little city like Lincoln, and he got taken on to Liverpool? And he's in the Liverpool reserves. He's 17. He's had a couple of games in the reserves. His name's out there. He's earning six grand a week. Yeah, Six grand a week. And he's shagging fucking whoever it is. Sally from Fantasy Island or whatever the shit is that they watch these days. You know, Love Island or whatever it is. He's got, I don't know, three, four hundred grand in the bank. He's got his AMG. He's got her off the telly. Like, England call up, want him to play in a couple of friendlies this summer. That's doing his, it's getting in the way of his shit. I've got an holiday with her and we're doing this and we're doing that. And I've, you know, like the, the, as you said at the beginning of this podcast, the, the meaning, the connection, the fucking earning something. It takes it away. It's gone. And I think your instincts are coming across there is like, that's where we are. Like we're at a point where billionaires are. It wasn't that long ago when you heard of Roman Abramovich buying Chelsea and he had like, oh, whatever it was, 12 billion. And it was like, fucking what? I think we did a stat the other week, didn't we, Aidan, where we worked out that um, Jeff Bezos, yeah, Amazon. Yeah. He's at something like 200 and something. Well, they reckon that's going to be the first trillion dollar company, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Uh, well, he's, it, I think it, the stat was something like from the day Jesus was born to, to today, if you earn 276, 270 something thousand pounds a day, you still wouldn't have 
the money that he's got. And do you know what fucks me off of it? Is the fact that I drive a bell and I'll, I'll see, in London especially, you'll pull up to a set of traffic lights and I see one the other day and I ended up giving him a tenner and a, and a few fags and he's holding a sign that says, X british army soldier mm. please help me i'm hungry and it's like that's what sick. the fuck is going on sick it's like i've got this geezer here that owns a company that is basically supplying products to, to most homes in, in europe you've got trillions of pounds worth of dollars or, or trillions of pounds trillions of dollars and this geezer's on the road with fuck all and all you're interested in is getting bigger mm. and this is why i believe it needs to be capped. I think if we can put greed aside as a government and we can actually put the interests of our citizens first and take greed away, they need to reach a point where they think, we've got enough, now let's help everyone else. Mm. Now, the problem the government will have with that is that if we do that, all of these are going to catch us up. And then where do we go? Because yeah. now we're all the same. Of course, yeah. And it takes away... You don't want to give away privilege. It, it takes away the structure of mm. low-end society, mm. high-end society. Mm. But there has to be a way that the surplus money that is sitting in banks doing fuck all, it should be... Whether they've got... I know that the, the rich people have a higher end of tax, but then you look at Lewis Hamilton... And this, yeah, I found this out the other day, and this blew my mind, right? Cool, man. So I've probably paid more fucking tax than Lewis Hamilton has, <laughs> yeah. yeah? But he's got all this money, and then he comes out, and I've got, like, my, my best pal MC Flight is black. And uh, we always have a drink, and we always get onto the topic of race, and we have really in-depth conversations about it. And I fully agree with what he's saying about why black people now have sort of an attitude against white people. Yeah, and the I fully oppression. Have the fucking standout yeah, from yeah. the shit that other white people put you through yeah. back in the day. And the, the discussion I have with him is that the bit I disagree with is that I'm not racist. Mm. I don't treat anyone any differently from me. Mm. So why should I get the flack for what some other white cunt done fucking hundreds of years ago? Because that ain't me. Yeah. But that's what happens. Mm. And I think in society today... That's what's happening. They use topics to take the focus off of what's important. And don't get me wrong, you look at the um, the incident in America years ago when the O.J. Simpson was trial was going on. Who yeah. was the um, who was the black geezer that got that got beat up by the police and oh, um, he didn't die, but they beat him. Not, up. No, not in the UK. I was thinking of Lawrence. It was in America um, for the uh, the riots, the LA yeah. riots. It, um, call, it caused riots. Fuck. I can't think of his name. Aiden might be able to whip it up, but um, I can't. But nineteen ninety-two, LA Riots. You know what I mean, didn't yeah. you? But Rodney King. Rodney King. There Rodney you go. King. Now, for me, that incident was terrible, but I believe that the way people looked at it was wrong, because in today's society, we're quick to jump on a faction. So, if a traveller gets beat up. It's, 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 it's a war against travellers. If a black person gets assaulted, mm. it's a war mm. against black people. Mm. And if something happens to a white person, white people say, oh, what about us? Yeah, what, white you privilege. About that? What about us? But what it should be is, it's not right because he's a human. Mm. It doesn't matter that he's black. It doesn't matter that he's Asian. It doesn't matter that they're white. As a human race, we shouldn't be doing these things to each other. And what I believe happens is, is that when these incidents happen... It creates an environment that takes the focus off of what's important. Now, you've got the Black Lives Matter thing at the minute. And like I said, I'm friends with Jimmy Manoa um, in the UFC. He's black. I don't look at him like, well, you're black. I look at him, it's Jimmy Manoa. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now, for, for him as a black person, I can understand the reasons behind Where he's I've got to fight yeah. for, for black people. I get it. I understand it. But I wish all of these incidents that happen, it should be more of... We as a human race should should care each, for each other more. We should love each other more. It shouldn't be a thing of he's done this to him, so all you lot of cunts. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. you're always going to get instance where a black geezer beats up a white geezer, or a white geezer beats up a yeah. black geezer, a traveller beats up a normal person, a politician gets beat up by a homeless person. Mm. They're bad incidents, don't get me wrong, but it takes the focus off of what the real picture is, and that is we all need to just be nicer to each other. And we don't focus on the politicians and the and the kids that go missing, weirdly. No. That, Do you know that, what I mean? That we don't talk about that. I, see, I, I, just, I, I, I just think that the priorities as a human race now are getting 
out of proportion. Yeah. I believe that when we focus on one topic for too long, it takes the focus off of another topic that is is more important. Yeah, yeah. I believe that we need to come up with a solution as a whole to make it more livable for people, the financial status of people in the communities, um, for all races, for all genders. Well, that that filters down, and that's a lovely way to start bringing this home, Tony, because that filters down to the initial problem we talked about with a kid that you're trying to convince to not do the crazy thing, make this silly decision. Because if he is living in that impoverished area where people aren't making enough money to, to have a, a life where they've got options to make better decisions or gain a better education that is basically the end game of this filtration system you talk of so if there is a great reset on the way let's fucking let's hope to god that we'd make some sensible decisions with that's it. what it right. is and it like we was talking about in the car before the covid thing the big thing was it's just before black lives matter it was um the 5g towers yeah now all these people i see moaning about 5g towers covid comes out Mm. Now who the fuck's talking about 5G towers? No mm. one. Mm. And this is what I'm talking about. You come up with a problem and it takes the focus off of what's really happening. Yeah. And, and, and and they're distractions. They are distractions. And there's if you look back across our history, there's always distractions. Yeah. You've got... Well, it's, it's in that book I mentioned earlier, The Art of um, 48 Rules of, of yeah. Power. You know, there's there's strategy to it. And what I found fascinating about that book is that some of the strategies are actually innate. They're actually instinctive. They're built into us, you know, of how to deception, manipulation, um, the, to retain your power, to retain, to to know where to look, to gain more power. That is just a fucking built-in mechanism. And, it is, and it's, what people don't realise is that when you actually sit back and think about it and you look at all these scenarios, the, the Epstein case, the COVID case, the, the, the Black Lives Matter, when you take a step back outside of the box and you actually look at it intelligently, you have to ask yourself, who the fuck's putting all these things into circulation? Mm. Because you can get... I mean, I'll give you an example. There was a thing in Surrey over by Reading where a policeman went to a burglary and he was dragged behind a car and he died and... All of a sudden, it was a massive, massive story. Is that the first police officer to die as a result of attending a criminal mm. action? Of course it's not. But that one got publicised. Mm. That blew up. So everyone knew about it. And this is this is the problem. I think if you look, there has to be someone controlling Something. what's going on. Mm. Are you seeing on the front pages of all the papers, Prince Philip is a nonce? <laughs> of course you ain't. Now, why is that? Let's have a look at that. Why is that? Mm. What are we seeing? Fucking COVID. Yeah. We ain't seeing Prince Philip is a nonce. He's, he's in a photo with his arm around a 16-year-old girl before he fucked her. Mm. We ain't seeing that. We're seeing, don't leave your house. Andrew, you're you on about be... Andrew there, aren't you? Is it? Oh, no, he's Andrew. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, no, Andrew. he's Andrew. Prince Andrew. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like all of these things are distractions to take you away from what's really going on and mm. what's really important. Mm. And I think we that's the level... That needs to be infiltrated. That's mm. the level because, it, you know, in all walks of life, it filters from the top. It filters downwards. And if the top is bent, the bottom's always definitely wonky. Of course, yeah. So it, we need these people at the top level to say, look, enough's a fucking enough. Well, do you know what I think? I think these kinds of conversations, I think podcasts have really... Oh, it's brilliant. I think these kinds of conversations are really... And, and I hope there is a, some young people that have followed your name and come to this podcast and i hope they stick with this podcast because i'm having these conversations all the time and we'll do this again in the future as well tony because i like your aura i like your message i love the fact as i've said a couple of times already coming back from experiences where you said yeah i fucked that up and i'm going to learn i'm going to not only learn i'm going to pass it on i hope young people are watching this and listening and learning and making decisions and maybe tomorrow they had something planned this weekend and maybe think mm, you know let's hope that that is the case as you move forward then as we bring this home you are you you going to be doing more podcasts? Are you thinking about doing your own podcast? Because um, this conversation is something I think yeah. you've got to keep getting out. There. I've got a lot of in uh, interesting characters um, wanting to come on and do a podcast with me. I'm going to be starting my own podcast channel. Excellent. Um, I believe that it's very important to get this out into mm. the open because, like I said before, there's not enough of it. Mm. Um, 
I've got some some acting coming up that I'm looking hey, forward to. Wicked. Um, so I've I've got a lot going on. So I, the I acting really is love. that kind of is in drama kind of stuff. Yeah. I've got a Netflix movie, wow. um, and I've got Vic Dark is doing a series about his life. Um, so we're waiting for that to to start. Excellent. Um, but that that's. This is what I go back to. My my passion now is I, I want to act. I want to get into acting because I, I believe I'd be very good at it, um, and I believe that I could I could fulfil a role to get the message out yeah, in yeah. a certain role. Yeah. Um, so that's something I'm very interested in doing. But it goes back to that mindset of I could sit here now and go, I ain't got a lot of money left. Fuck it, I'm going to go and kick someone's door off. Mm. And this is what a lot of people do. But I'm striving to be more than that. Yeah, and man. you have to. You have to, and you got. You have to understand that I have got. I've bumped into some of my friends, and the situation I'm in is that you'll get a lot of st- people saying stuff behind your back. Of course, but when they're standing in fucking front of me, they won't say a fucking thing because mm. obviously I'll smack them straight in the head. But a lot of it goes on behind the scenes, and I, I, I've, I've a lot of my close friends. I've had people say, "Oh, they bumped into him and they're like, why is he doing that? Why is mm. he saying that?" And the, my answer to that is, "Fuck off!" Like, yeah. what are you doing? It's so yeah. fucking good. And deep down, how are you helping kids? Deep you, down, Tony, some of them people? lads will probably catch some of this stuff on their own and think, of "Fuck, it he's is. onto something. He's onto something." But it, go, it goes back to that circle. You know, when you're in that circle, and it's like anything, like you're a grass, you, you, you're mm. this, you're that. Always oh, done a podcast, and it's like because you're doing something against the grain, you, you, you're sort of. Yeah, you feared you because I mean? you've broken the you've broken the status quo. Really. And then it's like my answer back to it is, what the fuck are you doing? Mm. Because when your kid grows up and he goes and fucking stabs someone, he's got him fifteen years inside. You'll be praying to fucking God that I spoke to him first. Yeah, to try and persuade him to come away from what he was doing. Mm. And it's so hypocritical. You'll get. I've had people in the past that are like. Well, fucking ain't snitches, don't like snitches, oh, never snitch. And then they've gone and fucking snitch. Yeah, of course, yeah. Talk's and, cheap, and, isn't it? And this is my view now. Whatever view people have, you can have your view. But don't be a fucking hypocrite. Don't say something that you don't mean. Mm. And I'm very, very passionate, and I, 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 anger is the only way to describe it. It is these fucking kids, mate. Their, their lives are being wasted for nothing when they could do so much more. Mm. And I've got a son that's 11 in November, he will never do what I done. And I won't allow that to happen. I won't allow it. And this is what I want to push onto other parents. This mm. is what I want to push into the brains of other kids that it might be really glamorous and it might be really good and you might be having a time of your life. But for that 10% of glamour, you're going to get 90% of shit and heartache and bollocks afterwards and you're going to limit your opportunities and you're going to limit the avenues you can go in life so i'm i'm not asking i'm begging that any kid that is watching this that is in that lifestyle that feels that they're slipping to a point where there's no return i'm on facebook tony gooch facebook inbox me i don't mind i will help you in any way i can i'm working with organizations that are setting up programs to help kids in these situations that I can put you in touch with any parents that they can see the the route that their child is going inbox me or help you in any way I can but if you do nothing the problem's going to come your way mm. in, in the not so near future and then it's too late and if you love your kids you'll do something about it think first Tony think first hey brother bring it in pleasure Thank you so much, man, for your time, and thank you Absolute for the message. Pleasure. And let's hope that if the young people are watching, that they take that in. I really I hope appreciate so. it. I really do. Peace, man.